Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you. I'm really pleased that I'm so fortunate that so many people could make it here uh, to our um, to our event, Forest Hidden Secrets, Why We Need Better Forest Monitoring. And uh, first of all, I want to, uh, to welcome you all here in the audience, but also um, online. And of course, I want to welcome my um, um, colleague, Marina Kaljurand. She's hosting uh, with me from the S&D um, group this event. And also, I want to welcome uh, our co-host, Fern, the NGO, well known in this circle, I suppose. <laughs> and of course, I want to welcome also my distinguished guests from the several panel I will invite um, one after the others. And uh, just a short introduction, as we are sitting here, of course, um, we know all that 40% uh, of uh, Europe is covered by forest. We know that this ecosystem has a really, really big um, challenge in um, climate change uh, times, but also in mitigation climate change. And uh, we know that uh, the importance of good data of our forest to have the state um, is a prerequisite of sustainable management and also uh, for protection. So uh, we need a better and a common understanding uh, how to monitor uh, our forest across the EU. And uh, the, the EU Commission finally announced after the EU forest strategy that I had the pleasure to work on um, to, to schedule this law for November. So we are all waiting for it now. And uh, on the practical way, we will have three panels, uh, starting from uh, the regional perspective and uh, what is uh, doing uh, now on the ground on monitoring. We will have also um, uh, this talk about uh, the old growth forest, how important is it for different belonging. We will um, look into details, um, the existing monitoring principles and ideas we have, and we will ending on having a look how this, um, this uh, future monitoring law can help um, the different uh, perspectives. So after the first panel, we will have a coffee break so that you can plan. And we will start at the beginning with an opening statement, uh, digital from our environment commissioner, uh, Virginia Sinkiewicz. So let's um, hear to him. Dear friends, today you are discussing old road forests. It's a topic I care about deeply. In the EU biodiversity strategy, along with primary forests, the Commission promised them strict protection. That objective was supported by the Council and the Parliament. Now it's time to make it happen. I'm sure you understand their importance. They are massive carbon stocks and powerful carbon sinks. For biodiversity, they are irreplaceable and their cultural role is essential. They are a focal point for local communities and they bind many of us together. A growing body of research underlines the political importance of their protection. While we strive to protect our old root forests, many of them are still being felt. That situation cannot continue. We need urgent action to ensure their strict protection. The Commission is working towards that goal. In March this year, we published guidelines for defining, mapping, monitoring and strictly protecting EU primary and old growth forests. These guidelines are the result of three years' work with experts in the member states. They propose that member states develop an identification and mapping methodology by end of this year. Mapping should be complete by 2025 with a view to achieving strict protection by the end of 2029. In addition to that, in line with the precautionary principle, forests that clearly meet the definition of old growth should be granted strict protection without delay. The key to adequate protection is knowledge. Knowledge about the location of these forests and about the state of their health. In order to map and protect them, we have to improve our knowledge. We need better knowledge about our forests, above in the light of increasing pressures from climate change. More knowledge means more awareness, which in turn leads to better protection. We are united in our understanding of the importance of sustainable use, because with sustainable use, we give a fair chance to the generations to come. That way they too can enjoy the natural services that forest gives us today. All grow forests shouldn't be a record of the past. They should also be a promise that we make to the future. 
Best wishes for your discussions today. So um, thank you. Uh, even if he's not here, we know he's a really vocal person and we hope that even in the Rochard we have seen now in the EU Commission, you will be a good advisor that all growth forest and forest monitoring is uh, important um, to our now, uh, new commissioner now that they really know that it's, a, it's an important topic uh, for us as, as Europeans. So I will on, hand over now to my colleague Marina Kaluran from the S&D for our first panel uh, precisely on the uh, old growth forests of Europe. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a kind introduction and, and uh, I, have to be, I have to make a personal disclaimer. Yeah? When I was invited to come to this event, I didn't hesitate. Because I'd say that foresting, forests, forestry, forest industry are exactly the topics that have to be discussed at this point. We are entering the final season of the European Parliament. Political battle is becoming more and more fierce. You saw it last July when we had the vote on the, on the no, nature, nature, nature conservation conservation. law. I also see that there are more and more contradictions artificially made between different sectors and stakeholders. Agriculture, nature, forests, forest industry, even political parties. And that's the reason I think today's discussion is important because every discussion raises awareness and has its role to play. Second, politicians are supposed to make science-based decisions. I'm a deep believer in science, no question about that. And I come from Estonia, a small country, and even in my country, there are different paths of academic thinking about forests. Two main universities, two different schools of thinking. And then the politicians are put in the middle to make decisions based on science. So for me, today's event is also a tutorial. I came here to listen to you, to better understand, and hopefully make better decisions in the future. As I said, I come from Estonia, and my summer cottage is on a small island of Hiuma, which is to the western coast of Estonia. And whenever I take a boat, to go to Hiyoma and especially return to the mainland, I see lots and lots of trucks carrying forestry, forests and logs out from my island. And where are they going? They're going to Copenhagen, they're going to Stockholm, and that's something that we should not tolerate and should not like. I know that my ministry has made a very ambitious plan of uh, until 2030, which intends to secure the precious resource and realize sustainable development goal 15, life and land. I also understand that public forests should have a special responsibility. And protection of old growth forests ought to be something that all Europeans could and should support. Today we will have also speakers from Scandinavia, from the Nordic countries, and I have to say that we are pre pretty much kind of looking at you and learning from you, not saying we're copying, but looking and trying to learn the best lessons from our Scandinavian neighbours because we feel on many topics our thinking is so much aligned. And having said that, we go to our first panel, it's Europe's old growth forests. We have three excellent speakers. Cyprian Galushka, Greenpeace, Romania. We have Jarmo Pyko from Ekoina, OU. And we have Jon Andersson from Protect the Forests, uh, Jarmo from Finland and Jon from Sweden. Uh, our first speaker will be Cyprian. I think it's okay if we go for the, by the first name, yeah? Yes. yes, yes. So our first speaker will be Cyprian. He's a Romanian environmental activist and conservatist. He's currently working as a forest campaigner for Greenpeace. He has long advocated for the protection of Romania's primary and old growth forests. Cyprian has been involved in several organizations and campaigns conducting various actions, investigations and advocacy efforts to expose and combat the destruction of the last remaining natural forests in the Carpathian region. 
So, Cyprian, please, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, first of all, good morning, everybody, and, and uh, thank you for the, the invitation. I'm really proud and happy to be here and give voice to the Carpathian forests. Uh, the next slides that, uh, that I'm going to present uh, are talking about uh, the situation of the old growth forest uh, in Romania, in the Carpathians. They are very much connected to what we already heard, to, to the lack of uh, mapping, to the, to the lack of uh, uh, identification for these, uh, these forests. And because of that, they, they become, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, things of the past uh, because we are logging them simply. Um, in Greenpeace, we have this campaign, uh, which is called Save the Carpathians. Uh, this is a priority for us, and uh, we hope that in the near future we will be able to elevate this topic and make it as a, uh, you know, worthy for the, the entire European community attention, um, because uh, we believe that the Carpathians are, the, are extremely important as a hotspot of biodiversity uh, in Europe. Um, yeah, I will, I will just start with a few notions, general notions uh, of, of the, the Carpathians. As you already know, they are the second largest mountain range and the biggest hotspot of biodiversity. Uh, this mountain range is crossing eight countries and covers a surface um, uh, seven times larger than, than Belgium. Um, it's true that these mountains hold the biggest concentration of uh, old growth forests outside of Scandinavia, although we do not know where all these forests are located, and I'm going to come back to this, uh, to this notion later on the, on the presentation. Uh, with natural rich habitats also comes great wildlife diversity. For example, Romania is uh, home to the largest population of big predators from Europe outside the Russian taiga. Um, as you can see on the slide, we have really nice numbers uh, describing the Carpathians. Uh, maybe one that is not so, so, let's say, worthy or relevant to be, to be in the picture is the 50%. Uh, it's, it talks about the 50% the of the Carpathian forests as being part of the Natura 2000 network, and we all know that. Uh, by now that we have a lot of um, logging and a lot of destruction without, uh, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of logging without environmental assessments, which leads to, uh, to destruction in these forests. So uh, we definitely need to, to improve that as well. Going back to the, to the campaign that I was mentioning earlier, um, two, two years ago, together with my colleagues from the region, we started a process of uh, understanding what is happening in the, in the Carpathians. We started a study uh, to, to analyze the anthropic intervention for the past uh, 20 years. Uh, we basically wanted to, in the Carpathians, we basically wanted to learn more of, of how logging is affecting these forests. Um, last year, we, we published a report, uh, which is also uh, in the last slide, very easy to be, to be downloaded. And um, for, the, uh, for this meeting, I'm going to just uh, focus for the moment on this uh, information. Uh, using special, uh, spatial analysis and isolating the, the man-made changes from the natural disturbances, we discovered that four hectares of forest canopy are lost every hour. Um, this is happening across the Carpathian region continuously, hour after hour, uh, for the past 20 years. So this is, this is huge, it's massive. The, the photo that you see on the slide uh, is from May this uh, this year um so yeah there's a lot of logging happening in the in the in the carpathians now the question is how much of this is old growth how much of this is primary forest it's virgin forest uh, that we are losing um, a short answer to to the question is that we don't know uh, we as NGOs have some information about forest age and structure. Uh, most of this information is coming from the forest, uh, for the, from the national forestry inventories, but we uh, for sure don't have any uh, geolocation attributes uh, associated with, with this data. So 
In short, what we know is that uh, we have a lot of old growth forest that is being logged at the moment, but uh, we don't know where, right, specifically where. The governments have this information because they have the management plans, they have, uh, they have data that, uh, that, uh, that has uh, geolocation attributes, but uh, at, for the moment they are simply not willing to, to share that with, with us because they are not interested in prioritizing biodiversity conservation. This is the truth. With no exception, the national governments from the Carpathian region did not compile such data, which uh, data sets with old growth forests did not recognize basically these, uh, this value. Um, it's no surprise for us that none of these Carpathic countries for the moment um, submitted uh, pledges for the European biodiversity strategy and they are constantly pushing back the, the deadline for, for doing so. Um, this is why governments are not doing it, right? They are not doing it because they want to uh, keep 97% of the Carpathian forests open for business. This is the status that we are now having. Barely 3% of the entire forest from the Carpathian region is strictly protected from logging, from uh, opening new roads in the forest and, and uh, other types of anthropic interventions. So we are currently losing old growth forests and even virgin forests uh, simply because we didn't identify these forests. Um, as I said, NGOs have limited resources, uh, but the EU authorities and the national governments have both the resources and the responsibility to stop destruction and to, uh, to protect the, the remaining old growth for, forests from, from Europe. Um, what we believe is that EU needs to secure the full and effective implementation of the global biodiversity framework, as well as help member states to achieve targets of the, the biodiversity, EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. I cannot stress enough for the moment the urgency that we have to identify these forests that are now open for, for logging in the, in the Carpathian region. Thank you for, uh, for your time. Thank you so much for listening to this. Uh, I'm, I'm at the end of the presentation, and I'm just going to share with you the fact that next month we are going to hold uh, a similar event here um, focused on, on the Carpathians. Uh, so we're going to go more into, into details with that occasion. But, but until then, feel free to, to approach me and to, to discuss uh, details. Thank you so much. Uh, Cyprian, thank you so much for your remarks. After we listen to the speakers, we'll have a time also for discussion, and I'm sure that the audience already has questions to ask. But just now we will go to our second speaker, who is Jarmo Bücke. Uh, is... Not, not now, don't push it yet. One at a time. I switch off, you switch on. <laughs> Jarmo is a Finnish environmental activist, he has come to Brussels from northern Finland, from the Sami homeland, Sapmi. He has been involved in mapping old growth forests since 92 and has been an advisor to several Sami reindeer herding communities since 2005. And I have to add a personal thing. 92, I was taking courses at the University of Lapland. And there I discovered that reindeer herding can go hand in hand with academic work. My professor was professor from one day to Thursday. Thursday she left, she went to her Sami home, and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, she was a reindeer herder. So that's something I was really impressed, and we still have contacts with her. She's a wonderful lady. Having said that, Jarmo, please, your turn. Thank you. I'm very delighted to be here and talk to you uh, about this question. Um, you see the first mm -hmm. slide. Um, and this is the question I'm going to present, and hopefully I'm able to answer this question a bit. So, will primary and old growth forests uh, found, mapped, and protected in Finland in line with, with the European biodiversity strategy? That is the very crucial question to us. Uh, 
And here we have a forest just next to our house. This is what we are talking about. Uh, it's, it's, we have a very lovely environment there. Uh, most of those forests are still standing. They are primary and old forests. <coughs> right, now I have the, thank you. Yes, right. So, um, so we, uh, as a nature, nature conservationist, I have been really as said, I have been doing this uh, mapping since 1992 in the whole country, uh, but mainly in the in the east and, and in the north. Uh, and it's a very it's a sad fact that uh, no so-called official mapping of primary and old forest has been done since the 90s, 1990s. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why we uh, volunteer environmentalists and mappers and, and scientists as well, we have been doing this work. So, and uh, what we have found out is that uh, most of those remaining primary and old growth forests, they are actually there in the north, in the Sami area in Sapmi. And this is the, this is our, these are our findings. Uh, so after two, and a half years intensive mapping, we were able to come out with this, this map showing that there's approximately half a million hectares of unprotect, unprotected or poorly protected uh, old growth forests, primary old growth forests in the north within the Sami area. Um, and then uh, I think rather many people here know already that uh, these forests uh, in Sapmi, they have been under heavy pressure, especially intensive uh, industrial logging. Um, and we have been uh, helping those Sami reindeer herding communities uh, to come up with maps showing this, uh, as we call it, the cumulative, cumulative impact, um, impact on the reindeer herding and culture. So we are, that's the work. So we are combining this mapping of uh, ecological values uh, with this, um, with this uh, cumulative, uh, in, with this providing information for this cumulative impact. Uh, and we have like able to show that this uh, cumulative negative impact caused by forestry um, has been heavy. Uh, and concerning some com communities, it has really actually been significant. So, and this significant negative impact is really forbidden by international law and the Finnish constitution. So it shouldn't be taking place. Uh, that's, why, that's why several Sami reindeer uh, herding, herding communities, they have demanded that the remaining primary old growth forest should be protected strictly. Uh, and this is now I want to see the animation, uh, how these lockings have proceeded. So maybe, maybe you just push the button there. So you should have, you should see the running year there, mm -hmm. how they proceed. So we are reaching the current situation now, and this is how it looks like. Great colors show the logins. And this is only within one uh, reindeer herding community called Muttusjär Jävri. And, sorry, yes. And this is how it looks like in the, in the whole Inari uh, region. So the red color means uh, locked areas. So, um, so what is happening now in Finland uh, concerning this strategy is that uh, we are having the starting point is that we are having like 7% of uh, productive forest protected, strictly protected. Um, but currently the state is making calculations that we have already reached 10% uh, this 10% target uh, to strictly protect 10% uh, of uh, inland waters and and lands. 
Uh, but the problem is that it's not, it's not eco ecology, eco ecology based, um, it's not habitat based, uh, it's an overall figure and it includes both boreal and alpine ecoregions as, as well as waters and land areas where intensive land use is allowed, like this. So this is a strictly protected uh, wilderness protection area in our region. And what is happening is gold digging. And there are a lot of these places. This is not the only one. Uh, so um, we have to, I think we are running out of time. So I'm speeding up. No, no, okay. no. Okay, very good, thank you. So uh, this is something uh, we, didn't we didn't like very much. So when the uh, Finnish Environment Institute tried to start mapping of this old growth forest, it asked information concerning state land from Metsähallitus, the, the Finnish Forest and Park Service, but Metsähallitus refused to give it. There were some reasons, but they were like economic reasons. Um, and, and currently there's a, there's a national process uh, concerning the criteria for primary and old growth forests. And it's heavy, heavily influenced by uh, political and economic uh, interest, uh, which is rather understandable always in Finland. Uh, and it, it, there's, a, there's a chance that this, uh, this criteria become uh, so tight that uh, we actually, there are not so many forests which fulfill this criteria. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually, because uh, the, the the aim of this strategy is to mitigate the, the loss of biodiversity, actually stop it, uh, the loss of biodiversity. So in that case, it, it wouldn't work if the criteria is too tight. Um, so, so we have been uh, trying to provide this information to the state. Uh, it's a very difficult process. Uh, at the moment, uh, I cannot see that it's taken into account fully. Um, it, one might say that it's ignored at the moment. Um, so uh, what should be done? Uh, definitely one of the most important things is that we have to take the SAMI into the process. Mm -hmm. Already it should have, been, should have happened earlier, already in the beginning. Uh, because the SAMI, they have got this, uh, I know everybody here knows this ethic principle, I guess. I'm certain on that. It's like the, it concerns the rights of the indigenous peoples. Uh, they have a right to free, prior and informed consent. So it means that they have to be included in this kind of processes uh, prior uh, the decisions and they have to be fully informed. So. But this is what we have been doing. We have been providing the information for the Sami communities uh, and, and enabled them to take part in these negotiations, which should start. They haven't started, but they should start immediately. And mapping information from all parties, uh, from all those who are doing it, should be included. Uh, and all because we have found already, we know already that there are a lot of unprotected uh, primary on crow forests in Finland. They should be immediately, uh, there should be a moratorium covering those immediately. Uh, they, they, should, they should be taken into the process immediately. So that is, oh, what happened? I don't know. What is the next on here? It should be, no. Yeah. The last one. No, that was the last, last one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, Jorma, thank you so much for your remarks. And uh, now we'll go to our third speaker, Jon Andersson, who holds a PhD in biology and he's currently working for the Swedish NGO Protected Forests. I'm not going to pronounce it in Swedish. He has conducted several field surveys in Sweden's forests with a special focus on old growth forests 
and has published also the findings. So, Jon, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um, I will hold a presentation about... Oh, yeah. Let me have that one. So, it is just... It's yeah. this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I start immediately. So, I just want to start with this uh, nice map done by Kaplan at all 2009. It shows the the situation of forests in Europe, like 3,000 years ago, Europe was covered in forest. And then in the 1850s, uh, most of Europe, or at least the central part, was uh, deforested with patches of remaining forests. And if you look at the Fennoscandian uh, area, uh, still forest cover. But uh, the interesting thing is, like, the situation, how is the conservation statues right now of the forest. So uh, as we can see in the right hand slide, um, the conservation status of most forests in Europe is actually really low. Uh, like if we look in Finland and Sweden, it is more or less covered by forest land, but uh, still forests are like in a really poor status. And I think that's important to remember. Everybody appreciate the forest in Sweden and Finland. There, there's a lot, but uh, they're really not in a good shape. And uh, if we look closer at the Fennoscandian Fenis area, uh, if we look at the density of protected forest, we can see that most of it is actually up at the, the Scandus and in northern Finland. And very, very little is protected further east and west, eastern, in eastern Sweden and western Finland. And uh, if we add also what we know about forests that are yet to be protected, primary forests and old-growth forests that are not protected, and we add them to the picture, then we see that it is actually a quite dense horseshoe-like uh, patch of forest up there. And uh, these forests are still logged. So what we will end up in with in the end is actually the A frame. And uh, the urgency of protecting this really high value forest cannot be stressed enough. Uh, I visit these forests every year and do inventories in them. And you find these amazing forests with a lot of species and they are continuously logged. So it is, it is a huge problem. And as I said, we know very little about these areas. So that is what the remaining part will be about if you put on the animation. So here is an animation showing logging roads and also clear cutting in these four frames in northern Sweden. So you can see that actually most of the forest land has been harvested sometime. And I will not read the text to the right, you can do that by yourself. But uh, I think the main message here is that after a forest has been logged once, uh, many of those most sensitive species, they will not recolonize. They are gone forever because the next rotation cycle is within 80 to 100 years. Or if you go to southern part of Sweden, it's even 45 years. And uh, very few of the species that actually belong in these forests will recolonize. So what you create is actually an empty landscape with trees. And... Um, that's also an important message. So if you want to see more about this, you can go. You can visit the, my webpage, skogsinsikt.se. It is in both Swedish and English, and you can look at all, all these examples of clear-cutting and forestry roads or clear-cutting itself, what it looks like. Um, okay, that's one too far. Now it's just... Ah, that's good. Uh, so this is just a zoom in on this area. So as you see in the in the eastern part of Sweden and then western part of Finland, it's like a frackled landscape, sparsely frackled, I would say. And uh, you see the the forest up in in western Sweden. It is uh, quite a lot of protection, but apart from that, very little. In my home county, uh, which is I live in this village Umeå. Uh, on the Swedish side there, it is 6%, 6 and that's actually including the mountain line area where there's a lot of protection. So, like, below that timber line or below that line, 
it's like three percent is protected. So, and uh, forestry is still going on there. And uh, the problem here is that we know very little about uh, what what is left of the forest landscape. We know that there are patches of old forest left that are still harvested, and some of the harvest is, harvesting is still going on in these forests, but we don't know much about when it's happening. Uh, so therefore, we have built this web service. Uh, so what we've done with remote sensing and AI is to try to patch out the, the remaining old forests. And uh, as our first speaker, speak, speaker mentioned, uh, we, the authorities, they of course have this information and uh, fortunately in Sweden, they also hand it out with the uh, VMS services. Uh, so we can connect it to our data and we can actually on real time see how much is harvested and how much is filed for logging. And uh, we also produce statistics on this on the web page so everybody can see how much is currently on logging notification and how much is harvested of this forest. And the map is covering so far the whole like Sweden. And uh, if you want to visit the web page, you have the web address down there. So, uh, southern part of Sweden, I mapped it, and the uh, northern part of Sweden, we still have the authorities' data. We are currently updating that, and uh, hopefully by the end of next year, we'll have it do all done. And, uh, and the thing with this data is that it actually shows the, the patches of forest. It's not a, a statistical thing that shows numbers, like how much is left. It shows the actual patches of forest, which, which is really important if we want to do anything about it. And uh, people's initiative, of course, is important here. And for them to be able to go out and, and do something and do an inventory and seek species and find them, they need to know where they are. And without that information, it is, it's not possible. I know that both the Finnish and the Swedish governments, they, are, they, they, they want to use the National Forest Inventories, which is a plot survey. And uh, it's just numbers. They don't know where the forests are. They just they know how much it is, but they don't know where know where they are. And um, of course, after we're done Sweden, we want to continue. And the first country we will go to, of course, is Finland because it is very similar in in harvesting history, in the methodology, and everything. So, uh, hopefully, we will do that, and maybe Norway. And uh, I think this should be done all over. EU and happily I hear that there are so many initiatives here now so uh, maybe in not far future we will have that and uh, I think it will make a huge difference in the um, I think how people see forests and uh, what we can actually do about it that we have we have the chances to see it and see it done and we can do something we can act and uh, the good thing with our methodology is that it is quite simple uh, of course, I'm sitting working with this every day. And for me, it's simple, but uh, I know I know quite a lot about remote sensing, and I know the method is simple. And uh, we're updating this data continuously, uh, both automatically via the services that the government provide. And uh, if they, for some reason, would take it away, we know exactly how they do it. So we'll just do the same thing and produce our own data to update it. So it's not a big deal. Um, and if we look at the statistics now, unfortunately, we know exactly, we know exactly uh, where people have done inv inventories and they found the most valuable forests. And if we look at the overlap with the notification, we see that it's about 400 square kilometers of known high conservation value forests that are actually fired for log logging right now at this moment as we, as we speak. And uh, we have a different category, category uh, where we know a little bit less, but we know that there are values there. And it's about 180 square kilometers of forest overlapping with the notifications. And uh, if we look at this data and when I work on it, uh, I can actually see the forest disappearing in front of my eyes. And it is deserting. It is it's just terrible. So uh, this needs to stop right now. Because if we, if we want to achieve any goals like this 30%, 17% or whatever it is, 
uh, it needs to stop right now because already now we don't have that much left. So, and this is just me and my colleague Victor Save, who is working with the web page, and me to the left. Thank you very much. Uh, Jon, thank you for your remarks. Uh, what I learned from all three of you are basically you're, you're saying the same things. Not enough mapping, not enough engagement from the government side. NGOs are doing their job but not being listened to. So in principle you're saying the same thing, repeating the same thing. So uh, as the moderator I will start with my question and please raise your hands catch my eye so that I can give floor to you later on. Please introduce yourself and you can ask the question from our speakers. Uh, if I start with you, Cipran, where do you see what can be done on the EU level and what has to be done nationally? Just specifically talking about the uh, Carpathian forests. Sure. So, I just want to first of all start by saying that uh, if we are on the conclusions uh, side of the conversation that technology evolved in, in, in the past years quite a lot in terms of what can be done by uh, analyzing satellite imagery, LIDAR, uh, LIDAR information and, and all sorts of stuff. And now we can rely quite a lot on technology to find out where these uh, highly valuable forests are. What didn't change so much in the past years is the perception of the authority on these forests, right? They, they are not perceived as being that valuable, and this is where we need to work. And if we are talking about implementation, then we would definitely need uh, a, a system, as, as my colleague already mentioned, that, that can operate in the same way for the entire uh, European Union area. So we would need experts to come along and generate that solution and improve it, right? And we would like to have all, and we would also need uh, national governments to prioritize this work, to, to prior and to, to internalize the concept of uh, nature, uh, nature conservation, right? Uh, otherwise, it's very hard to see how we can reach the ambitious targets that we have in the European Biodiversity Strategy in the next six years, seven years, right? Cipran, uh, thank you. And uh, Jarmo, I'd like to ask, at the moment, we're working on the treaty changes to the EU legislation. It's also the question of moving some specific fields from the national competency to the EU competency. One of the proposals by Greens, I think, is or was to move forests and forestry to EU competency. When I discussed it with my Finnish colleagues, they say that it's crazy. It would mean the same as moving in Germany automotive industry on the EU competency. What would you say about that? <laughs> I mean, personally, I would say that uh, uh, we are very grateful that uh, the EU is having these regulations. Uh, so uh, if all would be in the hands, uh, if all would be in the, all in, only in the hands of Finland in this case, uh, I would see that uh, this heavy uh, <laughs> political pressure, economic pressure uh, conducted by the forest industry would make it rather impossible to promote uh, conservation in forest in Finland. So that's why actually we are like, I was using that 10% target and I was using this principle uh, decided by the EU in the strategy that to conserve all primary local forests. And I would say that without this decision by the, by the, by the EU, it wouldn't happen. It would not happen. But it hasn't happened in Finland, even though rather many people have been uh, trying to uh, reach that goal and to work for that goal, but it, it hasn't moved. As I told, the last inventory of those forests was done in the 1990s by the state I was involved in there. 
and nothing since that. So, if I understand you correctly, we need regulation on the EU level, but that let's say the topic or the file should be still in the hands of the government, national governments. We should not move the whole sector under the EU responsibility. So it has to be a combination of both. Yeah, definitely a good combination. Good combination of both. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and uh, Jon, if I may, as much as I know, and Seem is here to correct me, the mapping in Estonia of old forests was done somewhere during the turn of the century, maybe at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of uh, anyway, before we joined EU. And we are a very IT country. We love everything digital. And for me, it's just impossible to understand how come with today's means, we do not have proper mapping. Even if you say that it's quite simple and relatively cheap, you're ready to do it in Finland, you're ready to do it in Norway. How come so far it hasn't been done? I think it all falls back on political initiative. I mean, uh, Landsat data has been around since the 80s. We have had methods to analyze it since the beginning of the 90s. And uh, as I said, it's, it's not that difficult. It's quite simple to do it. And uh, there is a lot of monitoring going on in, in Sweden for certain, but uh, it is only aimed at forestry so that they know how much volume is in the forest, how high the trees are, and they only need plot service to see that. And uh, of course, I'm always thinking and I'm always saying, why haven't they done this already? That should have been their, their first job, actually. Where is the forest? Where is the old forest? That should have been their first work, their first job. So, yeah, I'm equally surprised. Political will. It is political will only. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And now I open it to the audience and our participants. Please let me know, and I hope you have questions or remarks or comments. You're most welcome to share your thoughts. Yes, please. Did work here. Okay. Hello, I'm Tuomo Kaurne from Arbonaut uh, Limited. I'll be talking later in a panel. But I'd like you, uh, the opinion of all the panelists on uh, how do you see the possibility of, of uh, privately financed compensation for high conservation value forests? I know there was at least one hopefully successful case in Inari, but uh, your comments, I don't know the details of that. So each of you, please uh, comment on that. Uh, thank you. I'll look around if there are any other questions at the moment and we can group them. If not, then yes, please, the question of compensation. That uh, if uh, private capital could somehow be engaged and if so, then how that should be done to help protect these forests and basically compensate to the forest owners they wouldn't have to they wouldn't have a financial incentive to cut the trees. Sure, sure. So I think this is, you know, a great question. I think this is for sure, well, this would be the next step of the conversation. So after we find out where the old growth forest is and we know what we need to protect, then we talk about, okay, what's the effort of doing such, such thing? What I can tell you is this. Um, in Romania, the, the vast majority of the, of the forest that is being conserved, it's publicly owned. With that being said, private owned forest, which is 50% of the total, the total forest, um, or private owners, they don't, they don't see any incentive on going for conservation at the moment. And we are talking here about big, uh, let's say, landowners, but it could be also communities with small, uh, small forests and, and so on. And at the moment, the, let's say the subsidy system that you have, the, the, the financial in incentive that you get uh, for, for um, choosing conservation is definitely not moving people into that direction. So 
yeah, we would definitely need another meeting like this to discuss details on how to, to, to create such a mechanism that would be efficient and, and, and valid. Yeah. Uh, Jon, and, 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 yeah. I Jon. can, I can just fill in there that in, in Sweden we have had this, uh, um, yeah, that the landowners, the private landowners have got, um, yeah, money, they got paid if you want to conserve the forest. And uh, in the beginning, it was just the timber value straight off. So they did an evaluation and they, they got whatever it was worth. And uh, But nowadays they get 125%. So you get like an extra amount on top of it. And uh, I cannot say that still people are overly satisfied with that situation they are still complaining that it is too little and that the government is in interfering with their forestry and i think they will always do uh, but somehow i think they need to realize that this cannot go on forever we cannot just just because they own it they cannot cut it down it is uh, it is not only their business it is everybody's it is a carbon storage, it's biodiversity, it is all the things we need and all the things we discuss about. So somehow we need to be able to agree on, on something in the end. Yeah, it's a very, uh, very challenging question, I must say that. And, and actually you have to like to uh, separate the compensation for the owner and, and the compensation that is actually done for losses in biodiversity uh, caused by somebody, some actor, or uh, or emission uh, comp compensation of emissions uh, which have been produced by somebody. So there are two different questions. Uh, I would say that before we have very very clear criteria uh, for the com for the for this co for the concept concept of this of com po compensation in both meanings for for the emissions and ecological uh, loss losses it's uh, full of risks mm -hmm. so but I, th I know that they are uh, also the, the Finnish state is working on this and is, is about to come up and maybe the EU hopefully is, hopefully the EU is also working on this and coming up with clear criteria uh, thank you Jarmo uh, one question over there and then to the gentleman and then I'll give the final word to our panelists yes please Thank you very much. Uh, I'm an assistant to a Renew uh, MEP uh, who is very much interested in forestry and forest. He is a scientist himself and he was uh, in, um, involved in mapping gold growth forests in Slovakia. So I uh, don't take it, please, as a criticism, honorable member, but the forest policy is already a shared competence between the EU and the member states. It is not a member state's uh, competence, so that is the, just the first thing I would like to say. Um, and uh, then a remark that yesterday there was an email, event uh, organized by the SND, SND and Greens, uh, where the Mongolian uh, representative, a ranger, came uh, about how they protect their forests, and he, he was really disappointed when he flew over Europe, how fragmented it is and how it basically, it is visible. These forests are not all growth forests. It is visible, those are plantations. Uh, and he was uh, shocked. And so we are shocked that it is impossible in this developed world uh, to do what we are asking the other countries to do. I wanted to ask the scientists from Finland and Sweden, how, whether it would help if in the environment economic accounts the member states would have to report on the carbon stocks and not only on carbon flows, whether it would help and whether it would show that these forests are better than the plantations and uh, it somehow also uh, towards our obligations uh, in uh, climate change, it would show to also IPCC and inform that we really need to protect these forests because well, the stock is there and it doesn't help uh, to mitigate it uh, in industry and elsewhere and to, to substitute, but that we need to protect these forests. Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman over there, please. 
Thank you so much uh, to all panelists for uh, amazing presentations. I'm George Iordachescu. I'm a political ecologist researcher at the University of Sibiu in Romania. And I have a question to uh, whichever of you would like to answer. What would be the conditions to create a critical mass from the civil society to pressure policymakers to take action? I'm thinking about the uh, campaigns against illegal logging that, for example, we had in Romania that were pretty significant to uh, um, convince policymakers and politicians to have uh, proper monitoring and reporting uh, apps on the smartphones, for example, for uh, supposedly illegal transports of timber, what would be the similar kind of devices to, to convince the general public that these forests are very important? And I'm hearing uh, in your presentations and generally about these forests that they are bioecological systems, but they are also extremely complex cultural systems, very important for the identity and local history of lots of communities, including in the Carpathians, of which I'm very familiar from, from my work. Maybe this could be one way of convincing the public that they are not only ecological complex system, but they are also very, very important for place attachment and for, for local history. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your question, and and let's start with Jon, and this is with also your final uh, f final remarks. So, if you want to say something uh, in conclusion, you're most welcome to do it. Jon, okay. please. Oh, I can I can respond to your question to begin with that uh, uh, we have these kind of initiatives in Sweden as well, and and it is mostly based on different species that are red listed so these species are really rare and you're not supposed to destroy their environment so what you can do is that you go out and you find the species and you you take notice of where they are and then you can report it you make a report and this report it goes to the slu the swedish uh, agriculture university swedish university of agriculture and uh, everybody can see it uh, but the public can see it the authorities can see it and it has gotten so far so that many times the, the Swedish forest agency, which are handling the logging notifications, they, can, they go in and look. It is like the standard procedure. They go and look. And if they see that there are certain species there, the, the logging notification is not uh, agreed with. And uh, so that, that, I think, is very, a very good thing. Uh, what the problem with it is that not everybody knows all the species and that is of course a huge problem and i would welcome something that was connected maybe to culture or just uh, if you see something illegal going on that you could report it in some way and i think it it would be very 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 helpful um the problem with with sweden and finland as well is that it's very sparsely populated so there are very few people <laughs> <laughs> and and that in, in, in our countries it's, it's certainly a problem and I think therefore uh, like having a map where you can see where the forest is at least you can see if this filed for logging and uh, you can see if someone been there I think that's that's the base of it and if you can then also uh, you can you can find the uh, file a um, a report of which species you have found there it is it it will be immediately on the map and you can see it and it can be yeah everything i think all these informations need to be combined in one place so you can see it that because the way it is at least at home there are so many things but there are like five ten different web pages you need to go and visit and they're just too complicated so it's not for the public you need to be like halfway researcher to get there and to understand what you're looking at. And that's also like a message for those who are working. If you're going to do this within EU, make it simple, please. Make something simple that everybody can use. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. Jarmo, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this has been very interesting. Uh, so uh, maybe the main message uh, I had uh, was that uh, exactly how you see it also that uh, these uh, invaluable forests in the north, they actually form the Sami cultural landscape. So people are there, living there, they, they are practicing their livelihoods and they have been still maintaining these uh, biological values, high conservation values in those forests. So we have something to learn from them. Uh, so there are practices, uh, ways to use forests in a way that these, these values can be maintained, but they are not like, like we have done it now. 
during the last few years. Uh, and I also I want to also to to say that uh, we have had some progress concerning uh, the Sami rights in Finland. I cannot deny that, and it, it has the uh, it's the result of uh, cooperation between environmental organisations, activists, and the Sami, especially the reindeer herders. So we have had some progress. For example, uh, I could say that uh, this kind of uh, de facto FPIC is in place concerning forestry in most of the most parts of the Sami, Sapmi. But at the same time, uh, in your country, you are having worse problems, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I can understand that because uh, if you look at Sweden, uh, and you consider uh, the Sami area, Sapmi, it actually, uh, con it's actually, you can, you can see that 49% of the total area of productive uh, forest land is within the Sami area. Mm. So it's a big question. But at the same time, uh, of course, in your country also, you should have these same principles, yeah. especially the FPIC principle in place. Uh, Jormo, thank you. And the final words, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to comment a bit on the carbon uh, sink, on the, on the carbon stock of the forest uh, question. So uh, we, it's scientifically proven that all growth forests are the reservoirs in terms of carbon and that a clear cut is not holding any carbon, uh, uh, stocking any carbon. Um, but the, the conversation is quite inexistent simply because we do, do not have at the moment research for big surfaces. So over the Carpathians, although we know statistically that from the national inventories, right, we know that there are old growth forests, we don't know how much carbon actually they stop. There are some um, calculations being done, but for sure we would need more research on that. So, yeah, we are, we didn't start it on that subject, actually. This is where we are, yeah. Thank you. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank all our panelists for your excellent presentations, for answering the questions. They will stay, they will stay here so that you can also ask the lady, you can, I hope, get your answer also for those two gentlemen during the coffee break we will have during the day. And with that, we conclude the first panel, and uh, thank you all so much. So back to you, Anna. So meanwhile, we are changing here the stage for the second panel because the coffee break will be at the end of the second. I was wrong before. Sorry for that. Um, just uh, from my side, thank you very much for this insight. And uh, having been um, on myself in the Fagarash Mountains uh, this year, uh, and uh, having seen the incredible logging and also having been to Dalana and uh, for a few years to North Savo, I really know the value you have. And also it's really, really good to be here and to see that uh, the species that you can find in an uh, industrial rotation forestry is completely different than when you are in the old growth forest. And you can smell it, you can see it, you can find the species. If you are with a biologist, you can really have this sense that it's completely another ecosystem and they are shrinking. You've, you've seen that in the maps and we know that. And it's horrible how the different countries are just defining it so differently that at the end, I, I will make it a little bit um, maybe easier to understand. But if you say that um, climate change is now anthropocentric, so everywhere we have climate change. So at the end, you can define there is no old growth for us anymore because everywhere you have climate change. That would be the extreme argumentation to say we have nothing to, uh, to protect, but it's completely uh, wrong. And so we have to be really clear. Also, if you have some traditional use of forest, like in the Sami region, you can also say that's not uh, primary forest anymore, but that's not true. We have to be really clear on definitions. What do we see where and when and what do we want to protect? And that's uh, also an answer to uh, my colleague uh, from, from Renew is that, um, of course, we have in paper shared competences, but at the end, in this uh, legislation period, 
um, we try a lot of time to step in forest, forestry practices in a way and we never succeed. So uh, in principle, we have it on paper, but when it's coming, uh, we had this EU strategy on forest and we um, wrote down, it's good to avoid to do clear cutting, but that's just a kind of a word on a paper. And we see everywhere in Europe that these practices are legal, more or less legal, or completely legal, just practices everywhere. And so thank you for, very much for your insight, and we will continue. And I hope we will uh, also have uh, good ideas today together, how we can re remedy to that and how we can step forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So on, on the next panel, um, I will invite uh, Sarah Carter from the Global Forest Watch, Thorsten Welle from Naturwaldakademie Thank you. in Germany, Thank you. and also um, Apo Aola from Süke in Finland. So please um, take your seat here on, uh, on stage. Hello. <laughs> so for um, this panel, just following the discussion we, we had, um, I just want to remember that we had this youth discussion in Parliament about nature restoration law um, following the Montreal process. I think everybody uh, really close to biodiversity was uh, having a lot of hope uh, on the Montreal conclusion. And after we had the, this big deception, I have to say that the nature restoration law uh, was uh, such a, a political topic and not a, a scientific anymore. And uh, for me, it was sometimes really difficult looking at the old growth forest and ecosystem, um, um, valuable forest ecosystem, that we are not stepping in at least in uh, um, a um, anti-destruction law. Because before you restore, uh, some ecosystem that is really important. I think also we have really to protect those ecosystems we have uh, already now. And so um, that's, that should be the first step. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned just before, clear cutting of huge areas of forest, um, of uh, old growth forest, of uh, typical forest, or really valuable for, uh, forest are really um, are really common in, in more than the half of the countries in Europe and uh, other practices of forestry that is not maybe so disruptive that big clear cutting are also really common in a lot of uh, European countries. And uh, so now we are going to, to look more in details what kind of uh, existing forest monitoring initiative we already have now. So um, we, 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 of course, can go um, on the ground, can look at the forest, we can do some survey of species, we can maybe measure some CO2, we can maybe have a look on a remote um, um, digital images, um, so let's step now really in the specific term. What does it mean to monitor? What are the definitions we, we need before we, we monitor anything? And what are the methods we see? And so first of all, I want to uh, um, say um, hello to Sarah Kata from the Global Forest Watch. And that's really good that you are here. Um, you are based in the Netherlands. And um, Priya, you um, to join the World Resources Institute you worked at the Wenningen University in Netherlands and you managed several land and, co and forest cover mapping initiatives. So you're a really good woman for us uh, today. And I will just give you the floor for more or less 10 minute presentation um, to, uh, to introduce um, us in this topic of, uh, um, of monitoring methods. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm very happy to be able to present today. Um, I'm going to talk about the potential of satellite-based forest monitoring or maybe improvements for satellite-based forest monitoring in Europe. Um, and I'd like to thank many colleagues who have contributed to this presentation and people that we're collaborating with, some of whom I'm going to mention directly in the presentation. Hmm. 
Um, so I, I'll talk about several key issues. And the first, it's already been mentioned in the key, keynote speech, that, that um, better data leads to better managed and healthier forests. And at the same time, we've got these evolving policy needs which are emerging, and we need to respond to that with appropriate data to match those policy needs. And I think this is a very specific point that's related to um, being able to respond to indicators, appropriate indicators that really can tell us how um, well we're doing in terms of meeting those goals which those um, new regulations are um, aiming for. And then I'm going to speak about the increasing role or the important role of satellite data um, to support transparent compliance assessment and also the enforcement of these policies. Um, and when we're talking about satellite data, my last point that I'm going to um, go on to, into is some details of what characteristics these data need to have to be able to best meet um, these needs. Um, and I think the three key elements or three of the key elements are that we have open, timely data, which is available um, continuously for the whole of Europe. Um, and it's also transparent and independently produced so that people can rely on it um, to understand the latest context of uh, European forests. So we're not starting from nothing. I'm going to talk a lot about Global Forest Watch. Um, I'm a research associate there, so um, this is something I'm currently working on. We, we already, um, for the last 10 years, have been providing information about the status of global forests. Um, this is information produced by uh, the University of Maryland, who we work very closely with. Um, and it shows a, a more than 20-year time period of data. We've got in the green tree cover um, and then forest loss in the pink pixels. And by pixel, I mean every 30-meter pixel of the Earth's surface is monitored. Um, so we can see the changes that are happening in these very small areas and monitor any parcel of land which we're interested in. But this data really needs to be put into context. So Global Forest Watch, it's a website, it's a platform that people in, can interact with, and they can add these contextual layers which will give more insight into what exactly that data is telling us and what that means for new policies and actions. Um, so we have information on, for example, protection, uh, which is something which was mentioned a lot uh, in the last two presentations. And we also have customizable data. So we have analytical tools where people can upload um, areas of interest uh, onto the platform to derive specific statistics. They can also access data dashboards um, to access information like uh, bar charts and, and so on of the data that they're interested in or the area of they're, they're interested in. We also have email subscriptions to get alerts um, when forest loss is happening in a particular area of interest. And there's also tools like mobile phone apps where people can um, upload the data onto a mobile phone and access it um, out in the forest to ensure that monitoring can happen on the ground. And oops, this is a, an example of what one of the data dashboards looks like for Finland. I just pulled up a couple of the graphics which are available. And some of these are customizable. So people can choose the time period of in interest or the type of forest that they're interested in, whether that's a protected area, primary forest where that data exists. Um, so hopefully this data is moving from data towards information that people can use for decision making and to inform um, action where that needs to be taken as well. And Global Forest Watch has already reached a number of people. Um, people are using the data all over the world, but I think in the context of this discussion today, we need to look at how um, the information that we have on Europe is being used, how useful it is, what people are doing with it, and really what the gaps are, and how we can make sure that we're providing better information on Europe's forests. Um, Global Forest Watch is based on satellite data, but that is to say that satellite data alone is not enough. Most of the products that we use have been calibrated using data from the ground um, to make sure that it accurately represents what's going on on the ground. So these satellite data products, in order to be most useful, um, should be dynamic. So they should have some kind of um, active temporal elements, tem timely to enable this quick action. They should be spatially explicit so that every area of Europe is, for it, is monitored um, and they should have high enough spatial resolution um, so that we can 
uh, monitor any parcel, however small. Um, independence and trustworthy are other characteristics I mentioned right at the beginning. They should be open um, and transparent as well. And I think the, the key element is also operationality, that people who are relying on these data to monitor and to track changes and, and to see progress um, on uh, activities towards global, national commitments, European commitments, and so on, um, they should be able to be used in that context going forward. And I think where Global Forest Watch maybe plays a m very important role is to accompany this information with the appropriate communication so that people can use it and understand it um, in their varied stakeholder needs. So why are we moving from a global approach to a European approach? Well, Europe has very specific forest characteristics. This is just one example of something which is quite so spe specific for Europe, um, that most of the tree cover loss, so disturbances in tree stands uh, are related to forestry. Um, so you need to monitor according to these characteristics and taking that into account. We already heard about lots of data that exists. There is information. Um, EU Copernicus data uh, provides a lot of um, potential, but there's still a lack of detail sometimes, lack of information on specific elements, for example, this old growth forest um, topic, which was just discussed in so much detail. This is not something which is currently available uh, and consistently available for Europe. So this is something, um, just one example of something which we can work on. Um, and also in, in the context of forest monitoring, many EU countries themselves don't use satellite data um, for their own forest monitoring very much in comparison to the tropics, the US, Canada. So I think there's a need to sort of elevate the relevance of satellite data and forest monitoring within Europe as well. So one uh, satellite uh, forest monitoring product which has come out recently um, gives us a real insight into why we need to protect Europe's, Europe's forests and um, it really shows the destruction that's happening. Um, this is over the last 20 years. We can see that um, forests are getting shorter. Uh, also, we're losing most of these tall forests, which are likely to be these old growth um, forests. It also means that forests are um, ending up with lower bi biomass and being younger, so less useful for biodiversity and so on. Um, and there's also more disturbance over time. And um, in some areas, we're even seeing a reduction in tree cover area. Um, so particularly the Scandinavian regions and we're seeing a lot of destruction in, in that sort of area. So there are certain areas that we can see need, need work, but overall I think everywhere we need to concentrate on uh, preserving these forests. So what's being done about this? We're working with uh, GFZ in Potsdam um, who are putting together a data cube, which is um, a collection of data layers which can be accessed and analyzed together um, it's EU-wide, it's consistent, it's going to be updated, it's all transparent and open. Um, and we can derive certain things about the forests by combining these data layers. Um, and a number of things are being advanced within that list of things which I, um, I, I just showed you. Um, so that some things are um, that we're going to move from... Um, uh, wait, let me just go into some details. Um, so on the um, natural forests, we have maps of natural forests. They already exist for the globe. In this case, I'm focusing on Europe. Um, but we do need more information to make them better aligned with the inf sort of information which people need. So the information on old growth forests that people are collecting now isn't integrated in this map. So we need to improve it. We need to make sure that this really reflects the latest data. So that's something which is happening from WRI's side. Um, at the moment, we have near real time. So this is information which is updated every time a satellite passes over. We get more information on forest disturbances which are happening. We have this for the tropics at the moment. This is an example from the Central African Republic. Um, and we don't have this yet for Europe. So this sort of information could be really useful in Europe. 
um, to enable timely action. So some key takeaways. Um, again, better monitoring will benefit, hopefully, Europe's forests. Um, and I think ambitious new policies can be supported by satellite data, as long as the satellite data is really aligned to the, the indicators which are set out in policies, which should be relevant and able to um, really tell us whether we are achieving those goals. Um, so the two should be kind of evolved together, Research should feed off the, the evolution of policy and policies should also make sure that they're um, creating indicators which make sense and can be monitored operationally. So thank you for listening um, and we'd love to hear from you so please do feel free to get in touch by email. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, so much for your insight and for the work is done um, by the Global Forest Watch. It's really useful for us, we have to say. And uh, thank you also to, to come in and step in, in this discussion that the criteria and the defi definition that are behind the work you are doing are also essential, um, that the, 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 the work can be linked to some policy-making decision. So that's really at the core of our discussion today, and we will come back uh, to you and uh, opening after the floor. Thank you very much at this stage. And I will now ask uh, Thorsten Weller, uh, who is the head of research uh, at the Natural uh, Forest Academy. Um, it's the first time I think I have uh, to say it in English, but that's, uh, that's nice. A German think tank working on the topic of uh, forest uh, ecology mainly. Uh, you're also working on forest monitoring methods and sustainable forest management. Uh, you're very, um, very known uh, in Germany for this. You studied uh, geography with a focus on climate, ecology, uh, et, et, ecology and uh, remote sensing. So that uh, you're really the right man uh, in the right place. Previously, you worked um, at the United Nations University and also at the University of Stuttgart. That's my hometown. And uh, that's good to have you here in Brussels. And um, I'm really pleased to give you the floor um, to present us what your institute uh, is doing in, in, uh, in uh, monitoring and what are your takes for us in this discussion. Thorsten. Thanks a lot, uh, Anna, for this nice introduction. Could you please hand me over the pointer? Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's an important object. I here. think so, too. <laughs> First of all, thank you um, very much for the invitation and also for the opportunity to speak about our uh, research we are doing at the moment. Uh, today in my talk, I will also uh, present you another forest monitoring approach based on remote sensing and here for the example, uh, Germany. So this is an ongoing project. Um, we are working together with uh, Jonas Franke, who's the head of, uh, of the remote sensing solution, who's our technical supporter. And, uh, and us. So we find out, or why are we doing this? Because uh, we find out there's a huge demand on information, on forest uh, information, and uh, we find out that there's even a lack of open access and continuous, continuously updated information on forest characteristics at national level in Germany and also in Europe. And if you think about that, uh, Germany has a high tradition in, in forestry and it's re really um, strange that we don't have any updated forest maps. So, and especially after the strong impacts of the drought years in 2018, 19 and 20, we saw the, the need for full coverage and updated information to support national strategies for a really sustainable and climate change adapted forest management, also for forest protection and restoration purposes. And why are we here today? It's only a one good reason, because the EU forest strategy makes a legislative uh, proposal for forest monitoring framework. So that was the reason why we tried to develop a forest monitor Germany, uh, which is a first demonstrator, it's an online tool, to see how useful open access, open access Copernicus uh, Earth observation data are for a countrywide forest monitoring system. And uh, we are luckily here in Europe because we had this Copernicus Earth observation program, which offers a huge data for environment and also climate change issues. So we should use this treasure we've got here in, in Europe to use it for um, monitoring purposes. So coming now to our forest monitor, we have uh, three 
um, information layers, which are spatial explicit. And the first one is the distribution of uh, dominant tree species. The second one is the annual assessment of forest status. And based on this, we also detect uh, disturbed forest areas. The third one is an active forest fire detection. And the fourth one, I want to give you an outlook what is possible and what will might hopefully come in, in future. Coming on to the three species, and as I told you before, uh, we have a lack of updated information in uh, Germany, although we have really good data sets based on the national forest inventories, but uh, they, uh, those data are only gathered only in a 10-year uh, rhythm. And additionally, this data is only available on uh, sample plot level, so we don't have any an area-wide information about this uh, forest, forest status. But we use this uh, um, information to um, develop our tree species map. You can see the, the scheme, but this is goes too much into detail. Um, showing you now the, the map. This is the first um, map of uh, the distribution of dominant tree species in Germany. We have also like a forest monitor, similar to to the Swedish guys, it's called Waldmonitor Deutschland, Forest Monitor Germany, which is also an online tool. And you can see here um, in uh, seven colors the different um, tree species or dominant tree species group in, in Germany. We have four um, coniferous uh, tree species types and three uh, deciduous. Coming to the second information layer, which is the forest status, here we can see an example of the Harz mountain. It's a uh, mountain in the northern of, of Germany. And what you can see here is the uh, vitality trend of the vegetation status between the year 2017 and 2020. And you see in, in the red color those disturbed or locked or clear-cutted uh, areas where no living biomass is present on those areas. And in yellow, you can see no changes between those years. And in the greenish areas, you can see an in, in uh, vitality improvement. So this is uh, the science we got from the uh, vegetation signal. In the upper one, you see there's more or less a stable line from the vegetation signal. So this means no change. But in the um, graph below, you can see a decline in, the, in this line. And here you can see that the vegetation signal is, is getting uh, worse. Same region, though the example of the tree species map, you can see that the Harz Mountain is mainly dominated by, by spruce forest. And if you now overlay those forest status map I showed you before and skip back and forth, so you can see that um, mainly those spruce uh, plantations or monocultures are affected during those uh, three drought years in, in, in Germany. And this is an ongoing process. We have an annual assessment of this forest status. You can see the years 2020 and 21. And as I said before, if you just take those information, like this reddish areas, and ex extract them, you get a map of all disturbed areas in, in time. And you can also use this information to monitor the development of those um, clear-cutted areas. The last information layer is the active fire uh, detection, which is, an, um, which is a service provided by, by NASA that we just included in our uh, monitoring system in order to see what um, kind of active fire was in Germany during the last seven years, uh, seven days, sorry. Um, giving you now an, an outlook, um, what is coming next or what is also possible. I think this connects also to the information that Sara uh, gives us and, uh, or gave us. If you could use um, open data like flight data, you can easily derive uh, based with AI methods uh, each single tree and then calculate also like this tree height based on these trees. And with this uh, information, you could build a digital surface model. So you got the height of, of your forest system, of your ecosystem. And um, it's easily then uh, to derive the above ground biomass based on this information and also to, to calculate the, the carbon content um, with this, uh, within those um, biomass to do a carbon monitoring. So I want to conclude with um, six 
also, let's say, take-home messages. So don't be afraid of, of remote sensing. It doesn't replace work on the ground in the forest. It's important to get ground truthing, but use it as a additional information because it pro provides high temporal resolution and spatial comprehensive information which should be used. We heard it that the EU countries doesn't use it that much, and I think uh, we are sitting on a, as I said before, on a data treasure. We should just use it. Then we have this sentinel data with a spatial resolution 10 by 10 meters. So also the maps I showed you are 10 by 10 meters, so a really good um, uh, resolution. And the EU, data, uh, EU open data policy show the potential and benefit for generating specific uh, spatial ex explicit forest uh, information at a, a national scale. So we should really, as I said, use it. And the detailed monitoring of changes in tree species composition and forest status is, is doable, easy, easily on monthly scale or on yearly scale. Uh, additional data enables assessment of forest structure, biodiversity, carbon stock and forest height distribution. And the concept uh, I just showed you uh, in the, I just showed you in this talk is also transferable to other European uh, countries while using adaptive national approaches. And last but not least, the EU Copernicus program offers objective, comparable, multi-year stable time series that can be used cost efficiently, which cost efficiently, which is uh, also quite um, important to monitor European forest areas to support current EU forest policies. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And you could also contact me or Jonas Franke from um, Remote Sensing Solutions. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Thorsten, for this really interesting uh, crossover about, about all you can do when you have a good uh, element and also good data. And uh, it was, uh, I think, really um, really good to, to, to have it in mind that we cannot also see the state of forest, but also the evolution. The evolution maybe of CO2 sinks, the ev uh, evolution of uh, health of forest. So thank you very much. We will uh, come um, back to you and... Um, Prepare your question if you have some in your mind, because I will now give the floor to uh, Apo Ahola, but after that we will open here the round. So, um, Mr. Ahola, is, uh, you're a senior expert of the Finnish Environment Institute called Suke. I don't know how you pronounce it, but that was correct. Uh, yes, Perfect. thank you very much. Um, you specialize uh, in biodiversity monitoring and plant ecology. And in recent a year, you've focused on building a national system for monitoring um, exactly uh, habitat types uh, that uses also advances in remote sensing and also in modern day field methods. Um, of course, you are also stepping in an innovative setup for sampling. So we are really uh, looking forward to, uh, to hear you. Also, you work for the Finnish Environmental Administration on land use change, conservation planning and other environmental policies. So. We are really, um, um, yeah, looking forward to uh, to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Um, yes, um, so my name is Apohala, and um, at the Finnish Environment Institute, I have been developing this um, uh, biodiversity monitoring, especially from the habitat types uh, point of view, and. Um, First, I would like to clarify, as, as you were mentioning this terminology, that we have it clear that uh, when we are uh, speaking of uh, monitoring, so we can kind of divide it in the mapping part, where you make this kind of wall-of-wall -wall, uh, mapping of what is where, and, and then you have sampling-based methods uh, where you take a sample. And, uh, and when it comes to many quality, ecological quality parameters. Uh, so mapping is not very easy. Uh, it's, it's not very easy to monitor, make, uh, do monitoring uh, by mapping. So oftentimes the, you have to have some kind of sampling uh, method and, and uh, plots or transects. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, uh, in my current work, I'm mainly focusing on the quality part Mm -hmm. uh, we also get some information about the uh, uh, extent of different habitat types, forest types, uh, but we don't do mapping. So just to yeah. clarify in the beginning. Uh, so f first, I also added this uh, why uh, 
question here. You can answer it in so many ways. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the most important things is that um, uh, in this uh, heated and polarized argumentation, the solid scientifically uh, kind of uh, based uh, uh, and, and long-term monitoring data is the best uh, way to be on the same page and, and reach a common understanding, which is the prerequisite for a better public discussion and policy making. Uh, there are, of course, many, many other motivations for monitoring too. And um, uh, I would say that uh, it's important that uh, uh, we don't uh, monitor just uh, areas outside protected areas. Uh, but these all, all uh, ecosystems, all areas, every square meter on our planet is uh, affected by human uh, activity, indirect or direct. So here you see some examples of that. And, um, and um, I would say the climate change is also such that uh, that will uh, lead to many changes that are still largely unknown and hard to predict. So it's important to follow them as they happen also by this monitoring. Um, yeah, there, there are no animations apparently in this version, but, uh, but um, the, when we are talking about um, the key to understanding the needs for monitoring is that there is no, not one forest ecosystem, but uh, the forest ecosystem is very diverse and uh, we have to um, uh, give attention to all these very many uh, diverse habitat types in the forest because a major proportion of biodiversity lies within these tens of somewhat rarer <laughs> habitat types. And uh, this functional diversity is essential for, for nature's overall resilience. So uh, <laughs> just to challenge you, uh, uh, it has been a lot of talk about old growth forests, but old growth forest, it's just one parameter, it's just one quality parameter. So I, I would like to keep that in mind. So, so I think our approach in Finland is that biodiversity monitoring uh, of ecosystems must be done using the habitat type as a unit on that level. And uh, that leads us to some questions uh, related to sampling and also field monitoring methods. Uh, field monitoring is essential. Many Habitat types can only be identified and many important ecological factors can only be re reliably measured in the field. Uh, for example, talking about this old growth forests, so stand age or tree age and the amount of dead wood still cannot be reliably uh, mm -hmm. measured from the air. Um, and um, the other one is that you also mentioned this already that uh, this ground validation data is very essential. And it's, at the moment, it's the bottleneck for developing remote sensing. And unfortunately, much of the old inventory data we have is not accurately enough positioned. So it's hard to use for that. Then we have the question of NFI, so the National Forest Inventories. Can't we just get all the information from that, rely on that, and maybe add some variables there? But um, the NFIs uh, have such sampling system that it cannot cover the whole diversity that I was mentioning, uh, these more uncommon habitat types. So that's uh, unfortunately something that can be fixed in that system. And also the NFI personnel is not trained to register ecological variables or species. So we are developing NFI with new biodiversity variables. We are training NFI personnel, but there is a necessarily a need for a complementary field monitoring system. Mm -hmm. um, so we come to that. And in Finland, uh, this scheme is based on these three blocks. So there is the first NFI, uh, National Forest Inventory, based on systematic random sampling. Most common forest types are well represented, and we are currently adding more biodiversity variables that are to be included from the next year. Then we have this uh, general field monitoring of habitat types, which is a new, new infrastructure being built. At the moment, I'm, I'm leading that work, and um, it's based on uh, stratified random sampling and some targeted sampling, and it covers the more uncommon uh, forest habitat types. 
and the variables are tightly harmonized with NFI variables measurements and there are some extra biodiversity variables for special uh, habitat types. And then these two field uh, monitoring blocks produce ground proofing data uh, for validation of AI learning for the remote sensing part. And we have Finland, in Finland a uh, recent uh, initiative uh, to launch a cooperation for better coordinating the uh, like uh, production of input data set harmonization and also producing automated output uh, products. But the European collaboration here is also very, very important. So just to, this looks scary, but, <laughs> but uh, just to give you some view of this very important diversity uh, in, in forest and in our nature. So uh, we have uh, assessed uh, all habitat types in Finland and, uh, and, estimate, uh, and uh, determined the essential biodiversity variables for them. So keep in mind here in, in left, so uh, we are not limiting us on the wooded, on the forest habitats. Uh, this monitoring system serves many purposes, forest monitoring, uh, uh, directive Annex 1 habitat monitoring, uh, restoration acts monitoring, national needs for status assessments of habitats, etc. But if you look now at the forest habitats, we have some like ecological elements that must be uh, monitored, and then we can zoom into the tree and stand related variables, and there are a plentitude of different variables. And you can see that the three monitoring blocks can kind of uh, answer to a subset of these variables. And the GF, um, General Field Monitoring and National Forest Inventory are tightly harmonized together here. Um, this uh, I will uh, mainly skip, but just to uh, show you a, a, a little bit of timeline for this development of this new infrastructure, General Field Monitoring of Habitat Types. So we are still in the very early phase. Mm -hmm and we aim to have it in operational use by 2027. There are uh, many steps like uh, developing apps and uh, data storage and data management, etc. But it's based on, it's not based on plots, uh, but it's based on uh, transects, line transects that you can see on this map. And I have to mention that uh, the Swedes are 15 years ahead of us, so, so I strongly re recommend you to get familiar with the Swedish NILS monitoring program that we are also collaborating mm -hmm. tightly with. Last uh, thing is the costs, mm -hmm. cost side, which is uh, important. And uh, the perception often is that monitoring is very expensive. Uh, but when we keep in mind from the first slide, what what is the purpose of this, to, to be on the same page, have a common understanding, the common knowledge base? So I think these figures are quite reasonable uh, for such a large country as Finland is. Uh, so of course there is this investment cost as, as we are in the development phase, but when it's up and running, I think uh, it's, it's uh, quite reasonable. Uh, these figures are for the forested habitats. So the summary slide. Uh, we have to have a combination of different uh, monitoring systems, there is not a single system that can answer all the, all the questions. The National Forest Inventory, remote sensing, but then invest in a complementary field monitoring system. I, I encourage all nation, um, all, all member countries uh, to, to go that way. Biodiversity deserves similar rigorous and ambitious monitoring system that are already in use for use of natural resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, a well-designed monitoring system can be achieved with a reasonable budget. And then the essential biodiversity variables must be identified and harmonized. And, uh, and I haven't talked so much uh, of this uh, remote sensing part because my two colleagues took, <laughs> um, took care of that part quite long. But, uh, but that's, uh, of course, the availability, homogeneity uh, of this input data set and then the uh, development of harmonized uh, automatic protocols to have output products. That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Apple, for going <clears throat> deep in, in, in this uh, topic also, and so that we can have a sense that it's, uh, it's really a crossover mm, discipline. If you, you want to have good information on maps, you have to have also good uh, good information on the ground, of course. And uh, maybe I will uh, just open now uh, for remarks to our um, panel here. And uh, I 
will ask you to uh, to take the uh, different question from the floor and to to make your um, to end remark also because we are running out of time. Please, Stefan. Thank you for the question. Um, you had a question here. Yes. Thank you. Um, I had a question on, as a reflection on both panel. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, my name is Helen Koch. I work for the Private Forest Owner Association. Um, the, in, the private, in the first panel, there was this conclusion of a call for something simple. Something easy, uh, user-friendly access, and something very simple. And when I listen to you, well, I, I do feel that we have a bit the opposite. We have something very detailed, very precise, but very complex. So how would you foresee to reconcile this request for something simple and uh, very detailed and locally specific product that you have? Um, or And would it be meaningful? And again, like in this uh, question of uh, what would be meaningful at the EU? Uh, level. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I don't see any question. Now, last one here, please. Yeah, Martin Herold from the German Geo Research Center, the GSZ in Potsdam. Um, we have seen almost a bit this dichotomy between on the ground and satellites. Uh, and um, Europe has these national forest inventory based monitoring systems that have served well in the past, but we also heard that it's not covering everything that needs to be done now. Um, so the last speaker really nicely showed how the integration is really the way forward and it can be done and it can be efficiently done. So my question is like what needs to be done in Europe to actually make that happen? Thank you. So I would uh, resume. You have uh, the question about the biotic and ab uh, uh, abiotic factors, how we can measure them, um, how detailed, how meaningful can it be and what should be done at EU level? Maybe Sarah, if you want to choose one of those or oh, make a, a summary of all of it? Yeah, I can respond quickly to a few of those points. So, yeah, I think on the, the wildlife or animals for hunting question, I think this is where remote sensing isn't the strongest use of data um, and perhaps other data sources can be integrated into that. And I think actually biodiversity is the thing where Perhaps remote sensing is weakest at the moment, but I think there's a lot of potential. So there should be investment into seeing what we can do and what proxies we can derive from remote sensing indices to match to biodiversity. Um, there was a question on this kind of simplicity. Um, and I think what, what we try and do as Global Forest Watch is to provide information to suit all kinds of user needs. So we have the raw data for the people who can do the technical things. We also have the dashboards for people who just want statistics and, and to derive information which is easily usable and applied and maybe more impactful in, in, in that sense. So we try and do a bit of everything, which is perhaps maybe why it comes over as being uh, very complicated. And then there's a question on what needs to be done. Um, and I think the importance of national forest inventories was mentioned. Um, and I think they are very useful and I like where they're combined with remote sensing indices to produce better data. Uh, not every country is sharing their NFI data, so I think maybe that's something where they could be encouraged to share that data and, and then we can uh, collaboratively um, improve remote sensing data that um, is, is relying on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. If you want, you're closing for more. Um, Thomas. First. Yeah. As you want. <laughs> uh, thank you. Maybe also a quick answer for all three questions. Uh, we have also a project trying to monitor wildlife with uh, remote sensing. This is done by uh, thermal aerial images. But as you know, you can't do this for whole Germany. And even if you do this, you can't detect every animal. So it's not important. I agree. The conclusion of Sarah for uh, trying to derive the animal numbers for in Germany, it's not possible to do this with the remote sensing. Uh, also, the, the second question, um, like the simplicity, we also use our um, forest monitor and talk to um, forest owners. We are sitting together and trying to explain it and also 
quantify the results or validate our results that we have and we are using this information we got from from the forest owners to also to improve our monitoring system so that this is a usage also for for the forest owners and uh, last question i also agree to Sarah's uh, conclusion and Martin you are also a scientist like I am and I think the politicians play a major role in this but I agree if we have an EU open data policy and to combine our knowledge combine our data I think then it might be possible to to find a good solution for this thank you, thank you. and the last words for you yeah um, well to the first uh, I would uh, the main things uh, came up here, but uh, I would mention this uh, automated, uh, like uh, sound-based uh, uh, methods for, for example, monitoring bats and birds and uh, frogs and such. But uh, but these uh, traditional uh, surveys for animals are the still the way, and uh, Finland has uh, quite a good net, uh, kind of organized bird surveys. Uh, and we are using that uh, info as an additional info to uh, estimate, uh, assess forest health or condition. Um, then to the second, uh, the simplicity question. So yes, uh, uh, I, I think the way is uh, you, you have to have a kind of uh, complex data and then you uh, can uh, kind of uh, uh, produce, uh, simplify it and produce kind of simple indicators and data mm -hmm. products. And that's just the work that Suke is, uh, the Finnish Environment Institute is doing, uh, that, that there is this raw data collection side, which I mostly talked about, but then we um, uh, kind of uh, elaborate it into more simple products, data products that can be uh, uh, openly accessed. And to the last one, so, well, there is a lot of um, uh, collaboration European-wide going on, both uh, developing this uh, remote sensing and uh, field methodology and uh, uh, monitoring uh, direct habitats, etc. But um, I think it's the political will, and, uh, and it has been changing because 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, monitoring was the most non-sexy subject on the planet. Uh, nobody was interested in it. And, and there has suddenly been a huge demand uh, under the last years uh, for better monitoring data. And now everybody is interested in why don't we have the long-term monitoring data. Uh, so I think the ship has uh, taken a turn uh, slowly, but, uh, but yeah, nothing more to add. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I think also the um, the remark you did at the beginning that we are not speaking uh, uh, only, of course, of all growth forest and protected area, but we want to monitor also um, managed forest and forestry. That's uh, more or less uh, the, the the way where it it becomes a be complicated um, politically, because if you're sharing data, if you're sharing information, uh, you have politicians. I suppose they want maybe to regulate something. And of course, for some countries, <clears throat> that's not maybe uh, the way they, they want to share their data because they think maybe um, it's better we are doing it on our own in our own countries. And uh, because the example was named before um, that uh, in, in Finland, I suppose it was the, uh, the um, example from Marina, they, uh, uh, some uh, stakeholders told her, but can you imagine if... Uh, the automotive uh, in Germany will be regulate, would be regulated by the EU. It would be a catastrophe or Germany would not accept it. But I have to say, actually, I'm really happy that the EU is regulating the automotive in whole Europe. So we have minimum standards for CO2 for emission by cars. And of course, we are not going into the uh, industry as such, but we are def defining with the big goals we have with the Green Deal. Uh, with the protection of um, ecology and protection of our economic room, everything, but we are defining the minus, uh, minimum standards at the EU level. And that um, is also that, uh, as Green, we think we should do at the uh, European level, uh, not looking for each pieces and each traditional um, management system in each country, um, because the foresters um, know more about their own forest, but we are now being aware if you want to tackle climate change, if you want to tackle uh, biodiversity loss, we 
have to have a serious look on our forest in Europe, and we have to share at least the, da the data we have and at least to define common um, minimum standard. So in, with this word, I will let you uh, for our coffee break, and we will meet again in uh, quarter to uh, 12, so in 15 minutes, and uh, happy to see you in a few minutes. Have good conversation and ask your question. Maybe we had no time to, to put on the panel.
I will invite you um, and also the panelists to join me and the audience to take back a seat so that we can have the last um, panel. So I am waiting for Tuomo. I don't know if you know where he is. I saw him there. Yeah. He's showing his, he's, he's showing his maps. He's showing his map, eating some croissant. There he is. That's good to be in Brussels, isn't it? <laughs> we are waiting, Tuomo. Do you come up to us? I know you're working, that's good. Networking is also important. So welcome back uh, now to our third and last panel um, with a really simple question, having now all this information and uh, um, how precious old growth forests are for ecosystem, how precious are managed forests also for um, having wood, but also having biodiversity, having CO2 sink in the soil, and uh, having a good impression what we could do, um, harmonizing uh, forest monitoring um, initiatives that are really specific in each country, um, looking at um, remote system and also sampling. Uh, the question we have now, of course, is what should we do at the European level as uh, legislators, what can we do? And uh, for this, I have here um, a distinguished uh, panel with uh, Tuomo Kaurane from Arbonaut Limited. I have uh, Tamus Enyot Elu from the UCCF Forestry Cooperative, and I have Marco Onida from the European Commission. So we are going to step now in this discussion more or less uh, politically. We, we know that our Commissioner Sefcovic has announced last week, finally, that the forest monitoring law will, will come. Um, as Greens, it's not a secret that we made a lot of pressure, that we think that it's good that it's come in this legislation period. And um, yeah, on last panel, we hear from the technology company, from the forest sector, and um, now we will see what we can we can do with all this um, information and first uh, i was to, i want to introduce uh, tuomo to you he's a ceo of arbonaut it's a finnish company that is focused on building digital twins of forest if i can say it like that um 89 arbonaut developed the first forest inventory tools in the world capable to detect in individual trees from aerial and satellite imagery and being in business now for more than 25 years um, uh, you have completed over 100 forestry projects in more than 30 countries. And so um, I will ask you a little bit um, broader. Having done all this work, how can remote sensing help us to manage our forests better um, and maybe also to do better forest policy? The floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Yes, Arbonaut has a long history, and our main vehicle is uh, airborne laser scanning or LIDAR, which nowadays allows us to actually identify individual tree crowns, like all the 20 billion of those in Finland. And Finland has been mapping all its trees in this way for the last 13 years, at an agreeable cost, I would say, also. <laughs> um, and yes, we've been in climate-related activities like Red Plus in Africa and then Southeast Asia and so on, 
But in Europe, I see a unique potential right now, and uh, thanks for pointing it out, and in a way bridging what we heard in the two earlier panels, especially APOS insistence on monitoring biodiversity by field samples and how to combine that uh, with remote sensing. Now, Arbonaut's remote sensing, because it's based on this laser scanning, means that it's not so frequent as, uh, as satellite imagery. It's typically done every six years or every 10 years or so in natural forests, in plantations, you can do it on an annual basis. So it's more like a, a policy tool. It provides you a sound baseline to plan for medium and long term. And by what this I mean, like five to uh, 50 years of, of planning horizon of activities. And uh, all of a sudden I thought when I listened to Marco earlier today and to presentations that why don't we propose such a policy <laughs> which would reward forest owners if their forests indicate the possibility of uh, high, high conservation value of forestry. Something uh, with remote sensing, we can only do it uh, through proxy variables. So just like Apu said that remote sensing can provide you indication of species distribution, tree height. Nowadays, we can do dead, uh, dead trees at the resolution that we do. We can detect individual dead trees or, for example, canopy structure, whether you have an even-aged or variable canopy structure. They don't guarantee that there's high value, but they probably narrow down the area that needs to be field sampled to such, uh, such a small percentage, knowing that uh, the old growth forests are, are rather rare, that first... Uh, it, it doesn't cost too much to compensate quite well, let's say, to the tune of at least twice the value of timber to the forest owner for this possibility in the first place that would be then verified on the field. And also being a relatively small area wouldn't get such resistance from the forest industry that uh, do insist on having their, their <laughs> timber volume, especially in this Finnish situation, which we, yeah, we have to live with it. Uh, we, we are dependent on forest resources. And that would be a beautiful example of European legislation or initiative if it were to be possible. So I rest my case there. Thank you very much for your, um, your insight and your thoughts on that. Before turning to my next speaker, I want also to welcome, I forgot, Michal Wiczek. He is here. He is a uh, colleague MEP uh, from mine. He's from Slovakia. He's from the new, new group. And I think he's a uh, second forester we have here for a scientist in the uh, parliament with me. I'm not sure, but uh, welcome uh, to you and uh, good to have you here. Thank you very much. Just one short remark, technical remark. I've never been a forester. Uh, yeah. I'm an ecologist. A forest scientist. <laughs> You're a forest scientist. Okay, yes. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also I have uh, my colleague Nicola Stefanuta from Romania. He's online and he will speak to you after. So I wanted to be, uh, to be clear on that, that I'm not uh, here alone and that uh, yeah, policy is just working when we are doing uh, Good job, uh, yeah, group crossover, and uh, I'm really pleased that you are here. So my next speaker is Tamuz Enot Elu. Um, you are a forest engineer, and uh, you are secretary general of UCFF, Les Coopératives Forestières, a French umbrella organization of uh, 70 private forestry cooperatives. 75% of the forests in France are in private hands, and so you are coordinating with the organization the collaboration of and exchange of technical resources among the private <clears throat> owners. And um, uh, Mr. Elu, how is forest monitoring currently implemented uh, among the private owners and friends? And what can you give us as thought? What should do the EU um, to, uh, to get better EU-wide? Thank you for, for your invitation. Uh, yes, I'm representing forestry cooperatives in France. And uh, just to, to, to be clear, just forest cooperatives are support private owners in their management of the forest. Uh, they support and support different technical, environmental, and uh, economical solutions for them. And we write sustainable documents. We uh, are actors of the wood supply chain also. We make reforestation activities. All the kind of activities and forestry work you can imagine in the forest are, can be done with these uh, cooperatives. And why are we acting like this? Because we are acting to have a healthy forest and that they can bring us all the services we need from the forest. Just maybe uh, um, some data in, in France, just to better understand my, uh, my speech. 
the forest in France has uh, doubled uh, its surface in 150 years. Mm -hmm. Just the same thing with the volume. Uh, we have a lot of small private owners, the average is 4 hectares, sometimes in different places also. And the, we have 138 different forestry trees in France, which is uh, maybe different in, in, in other countries. And so we have the majority of hardwood stands, more than 60%. And when I say this data, it's because the IGN, which is our national inventory, forest inventory in France, follow this kind of data and, and publish everything like that. R regarding what, what is happening in private forest, uh, it is 75% of the forest in France, and it's around 12 million hectares. And we know, according to the data, that 6 million hectares has no proof of any management activities. We are in this kind of, of, uh, of uh, context, and only 30% have sustainable document. And these sustainable document management, they are validated by, by, by the state. Uh, just it is for, for the picture of what is happening in France. What are our challenges? And, and I will come to, to, the, to the topic also of this conference. Our main challenge as forest operator, as uh, forest managers, is uh, to fight the climate change impact to understand more and more what is happening in our forest, in our very different forest, and to act as, as a better way as we can do. Other topics we have to do is to protect biodiversity inside the forest. Uh, in, in France, and according to the data as we have, it could, it's, it's well done in France, and, uh, and we are very happy to that. Another challenge we have to understand also in our daily work, because we are every day in, in the forest is it is to maintain the private owner motivation to to act in this forest mm -hmm. in a way or another i heard the first question about the compensation and, and this but they decide at the end to do something so we need to bring them in a way that we maintain the lc, LC forest and our main challenge also is to supply wood to the eu industries because we all use wood-based product in our daily life, and I'm very happy to see this room, and I imagine that the wood is coming from EU forest and transformed by an EU industry. Yeah. yeah, we hope so. And we need to put it more, because we, we think that sustainable forest management and wood-based product is part of the solution of what is happening now with climate change, with rural employment, with, uh, self, uh, with um, autonomy on this raw, raw material. Uh, to answer to the question, what, uh, why we need better forest monitoring? Yes, to, to be able to protect and to restore nature. Yeah, for sure, like this. Uh, to protect against what? It is my, my point. Uh, against illegal logging? Yeah, for sure. It's not a question. It is the answer. Yeah. Illegal logging is illegal. We can also protect and restore nature against game damages. So one of you has, has asked the question about this. It is a very big problem in France because we have no more uh, natural regeneration in our forest. So we need to find solution. Maybe it's reforestation. And what we, what we need to protect also is against fires. And we all know that fires follow the men and because we have activities in forest. So we need to protect. But as forest manager saying that, we need to adapt forest to climate changes. We have a lot of problems with that. We have hardwoods with problems, we have softwood with problems, we have mountainous areas with problems, Mediterranean areas also. So it is something that we need to, to be more active and to act more and to act in a better way. And with monitoring, uh, it's very important for us just to, to better understand what is happening. When I say we need to act more and we need to act better, we, need, we don't have all the answers are our questions. So we need scientists, we need everybody to go inside our question. We have sustainable uh, management document. We are every day, we are implementing what is written in this document. We use Sentinel-2 uh, images. We use uh, drone uh, pictures also. We, could, we would like to use LIDAR also uh, data. It's interesting. It's, it is like a, 
decision-making solution. But it is not only the solution. Uh, we need to check on the ground what is really happening. These data, these remote sensing data, they will help us to, to better go to these areas or, or the other one. But we cannot manage forest only with satellite image or drone pictures. It is, it is not possible. But so what we need to, to act in the forest, we need up-to-date data. It's for sure. We need to better understand and knowledge what is our impact and our activities about biodiversity, about carbon, about the soil, about the forest. Uh, and we need uh, decision-making tools. We have some of them in France, like BioClimSol or Climessence, just to help us to, to, to answer to the question, what trees can be planted today in order that it, they will be harvested in 100 years? They help us, and we need this as, ma as manager. So there is, there is very different, uh, different forests. There are different solutions. And, uh, and we need also to, to develop the wood-based market. Because when you have 138 different trees, and if nobody, no sawmills or no other industry is available in one of these trees, you don't have any solution to propose to a private owner to make a silviculture. So we need to develop the use of food and to develop the, 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 um, the industry. About the question about which kind of data to improve, to improve a forest monitoring across Europe, we need more and better data for, for sure. We have a lot. We have some reporting about Forest Europe and the FAO, Eurostat also. There is a network, a uh, European National Forest Inventory Network, there is something about EFIS or about forest fires, uh, it, it exists. But what we need is appropriate harmonized data, just to be sure that we can take the good decision. And you, as a policy maker, is very important. So the question is not that we need or not. Yes, we need data, but what, how to do it? I think we, we, can, we can map the, the best practices uh, we have in, in this network, uh, ENFIN, European Net National and Forest Inventory Network. Uh, maybe the EGN in France can, can do something. They are working on it, and it is very important to support them to create this, this network. What we need also about data is it's a bottom-up approach about that, because we are on the ground every day. My engineer, my technicians they are, and the, and the forest uh, uh, workers, they are in the ground and they, need, and they need some information and they will tell us what they need. It, it, it is on, on very, very on this, on this base. And what I say, uh, but maybe because I'm French, uh, we have all the basic package about that. We don't need to, to, to destroy something and to create something that should be new. No, we are this, we can use it better. And what we need is to have accurate data for our activities, very different activities. We need also projection. What will be the European forest in 100 years? If I take the French case, they say that the climate in Paris in 100 years, at the end of this century, sorry, will be the same as Sevilla climate. So I imagine, because I am a forest engineer, that the forest around Paris today will not be the same in 100 years, but more likely they will uh, look like the Andalusian uh, forest. So as forest manager, we are acting, we would like to, to better understand what will happen in there, and we need data to, for, to, for this, in a way to have a decision-making tools. We need that. And for sure, nobody knows exactly what will happen in 10 years. Nobody will know what will happen in 10 days also, but we need to act and with the scientists and, and, and everybody. And, and maybe last point about, about that, uh, we need data, but what we need really is added value. Because data for data is not my, my, my preoccupation. We need added value for forest managers, for private owners, for the wood-based industry, for everybody that has a value to something. Uh, to better adapt forest, the different forest, and, uh, and for that we need money. Some of you, and I really appreciate the previous uh, presentation about the cost of, of, uh, of the data, uh, is not for free. So we, we really need added value. And maybe the, for the for maybe last two, two messages, uh, the data is for you at the European Parliament. It's better to have the good data, the correct data, and to understand what is happening 
to have good policies. And what we need as forest manager is to have current policies about biodiversity, about carbon, about employment, about everything you want, everything you need, because at the end, the people who are acting in the forest are the forest manager, the owners, and the wood-based industry. So we need visibility and current policies. And last point uh, is um, when you show data, you, it's, a, it's a dream for me just to explain what are the drivers, what are the causes of these data. Because when I see in the newspaper some big title you know, and say, okay, they say that, but why? Why the forest is dying? In France, we know it's because of climate change. It is not illegal logging in my country. But why forests are, the, uh, are not die, dying also? Because of temperature, because of this, because of that. We have a role to explain to the society what is happening in the forest. Because the forest today will not be the forest in 100 years. And our role, our responsibility, is to have healthy forest in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you for having the, the, the floor and, and put the wood sector uh, in, in the middle of the discussion. Um, I'm sure everybody is aware that uh, the, the wood sector and also um, the rural areas are really linked to what is happening in the forest. So we, we, we cannot um, forget them and we should not. And all, all, of course, all the ecological wildlife regulation and uh, natural, uh, natural regeneration is also um, a topic that uh, will be really interesting in the discussion on the monitoring law because we uh, don't not um, want the monitoring law just to be for protecting protected area or to more protect but also forest manage, management or forest managed area and so um, and that's a recurrent discussion I have to say because when we are deciding in complete other uh, discussion about uh, RED, about the package uh, industry, always is coming back the question, but is this paper coming or this pulp coming from sustainable managed forest or not? But now we have to see, we have a lack of information on that because it depends. It depends not only if it's coming from Europe or outside, it depends what do you think, what is sustainable uh, forest management? If it's really sustainable in all topic and belongs we know today from biodiversity to co2 uh, sink to soil uh, to long-term perspective or it is just the kind of amount of wood that is in 100 years the same than today and um, that's a purpose i think we are uh, touching the really interesting data as we know uh, we need because um, in a way and i had the discussion also in the break we cannot define all growth or primer forest or um, sustainable managed forest in the same uh, way in each country. Because, of course, each country in um, each ecological space, uh, in France you have more uh, than one, and uh, um, you have to define really precise what is a sustainable um, managed forest here, what is an all growth forest here, and what are the criteria. But at the end, what we want is at least um, being able to compare this because that is what is lacking today in the, um, in the discussion on the forest monitoring. So thank you very much for your, for your thoughts on this and that we are really aware that a lot of persons are just um, working in this industry and in this uh, field and they need also um, a kind of predictability what is doing uh, coming from the European Union and to come back to your thoughts, of course, at the end. Um, I think we are not going to be able to fix everything that is missing in the forest policy in Europe with the monitoring law. I think we should be aware of that, but it's a first step. If we are defining the right criteria, uh, the right methods, if we are mainstreaming uh, the basic information, we can after have some thoughts about how to compensate maybe uh, such practices or other practices. If we don't have the data, if we don't have a common understanding, it will be really difficult to step in. And so I'm really pleased now to have Marco here. Um, he works at the European uh, Commission, DG Environment. He's a forest team leader in the Land Use and Management Unit. 
Um, you joined the Commission a long time ago, I've seen, and you worked uh, also for the Parliament. So I'm really happy to have you here. You are really uh, in depth in this um, land use and forest topic for a long time. And I want to uh, just to have a really uh, uh, simple question. What can we now expect from the Commission on this forest monitoring? Because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a paper, it's, it's a law we are waiting a long time for. And now at least uh, it, it, will, um, it will come in, uh, in, in this autumn. And so maybe you can give up some, uh, some insight what, what you know what is in. And uh, uh, we can, uh, after that, going in a discussion, um, what kind of pressure you, you need <laughs> to make it better. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you for your kind word. And, and on behalf of DG Environment, <clears throat> thank you for this invitation to participate in an extremely interesting uh, event. I've been taking very carefully notes, uh, of, uh, and I'm really happy also about the, the very balanced approach uh, that is something that in forest we, we really need. Uh, um, well, I'm not sure I, I can tell you uh, what we can expect because I cannot preempt what the Commission will decide. <laughs> but uh, I will, uh, I mean, the, 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 the College of the Commissioners will decide, uh, which hasn't been uh, happening yet, uh, it's been announced. Uh, but I will happily uh, tell you what the what they're thinking behind and what the rationale and uh, and what uh, what can be done at the EU level basically which is actually also the the title of uh, of of this uh, of this panel just maybe to 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 say i think it's important to recall that we are not starting from scratch the the EU had legislated on on monitoring in the 90s already there were regulations on uh, on forest monitoring on the consequence of forest fires and air pollution and then a regulation called forest focus which also included some monitoring on on biodiversity uh, that was uh, was discontinued uh, in 2006 incidentally it's also interesting because these uh, these regulations were the ones in in the context of which the the courts ruled that uh, the US competence for for forest uh, uh, forest protection falls under environmental policy uh, to use the words of the court the court said that uh, the heritage represented by the forest ecosystems uh, are something that needs to be protected uh, at European level. So the, the question is now: um, we we uh, we are back uh, after a, a gap of, of uh, several years, almost 20 years, uh, and uh, the question is now to bring uh, an, a new instrument uh, which makes a balance between efficiency and subsidiarity. Considering, of course, that uh, compared to uh, to the past, we have a much worse emergency situation uh, as. A, um, uh, my French speaker Hello uh, just said uh, that we have a situation of, of uh, forests which are which are um, dying. Uh, although uh, it's also important to say that uh, the forests are dying for climate change, but this is not just because of climate change; it's also because of the choices that have been made in complete good faith. Of course, uh, when we uh, 70 years ago decided to, to go for monocultures. Uh, biodiversity is an insurance policy that, uh, in uh, at the end of World War II, was not uh, not uh, on the not much on the agenda. Um, uh, of course, in the end, uh, uh, I, I'd like to, to to quote my my friend uh, Francis Halle. He always says that the, the forests they don't care about climate change because if you consider that forests uh, are uh, um, uh, 300. Uh, 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 380 million old uh, years old, uh, and uh, mankind is only 300,000. Uh, then, uh, in the end, the uh, forests don't care about climate change. But the problem is that we cannot afford it. Uh, we, we 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 need to act um, to act now. And, and as you very very rightly said, we need to to plan the forest of the next uh, the next years. Uh, now, why the rationale of uh, of uh, of the Commission initiative uh, is uh, first of all that we need. Uh, to speak a common language. We have uh, uh, to, um, to build on a lot of good things which have been made and which has been done in the past, uh, past years uh, by the member states, uh, but which today is not sufficient to have uh, a common language in light of the challenges that we are facing, in particular the resilience, uh, the biodiversity loss, the climate and so on. So, um, the idea is to have a combination, and here I really like the words of, uh, of um, Apo, uh, who said that we need a combination of systems. And that's precisely uh, what, what we are thinking, a combination of systems that means uh, we should, for sake of efficiency, 
exploit what we have in terms of technology, remote sensing, Copernicus. Uh, we had several meetings with member state experts, and it was quite interesting for me to see that uh, at the first meeting, uh, most of the member state experts uh, said uh, uh, that they do not use Copernicus. They do not use Copernicus because uh, the monitoring at member state level is basically organized around the NFIs, which is in many countries also very efficient, but it's basically ground-based. Uh, so we think that, for instance, for, uh, um, for uh, uh, variables like forest area, tree cover density, forest types, uh, forest connectivity, defoliation, uh, forest fires, uh, risk assessment, uh, tree cover disturbances. Remote sensing is, uh, is very important, and I think Tuomo uh, is, is confirming that because he's doing it. Um, so that is something that basically the Commission will bring in as a service, as a service to the countries. Then the countries might want to take it up, might not want to take it up, but this is something that we should use our own resources to do it. Then, the second part uh, is um, uh, to build on what the member states already have, uh, that is more the ground-based uh, data collection, because uh, as uh, many said, there are things that with remote sensing you can't do, uh, dead wood location of forest habitats, uh, uh, stand structure, tree species composition, uh, and so on and so forth. And there you really need to uh, have ground observation, which is, by the way, as also, I can't remember who said it, I think it was uh, Torsten who said it, that there's a bottleneck of uh, remote sensing because you need to calibrate with ground-based data. And if the ground-based data are not available, you cannot use the remote sensing efficiently enough. So the two things really, really go together. And that is basically the, the skeleton of, uh, of what we have in mind to, to, to reply to reply to your to your question, um, Anna. We think this is uh, this is crucial uh, also because we need to use science for forests. Uh, and uh, I'm, I really uh, witnessed what has happened, for instance, uh, with this uh, paper that was published in 2020 by our colleagues of the JRC using using uh, remote sensing uh, to to monitor uh, harvest and that that. that this triggered uh, such a harsh discussion with even even uh, intervention with refer, uh, referring to the paper by some prime minister. Uh, and then there was, of course, there was an issue because there was a problem with an, uh, an algorithm in, in, in the data available by, by the Hansen uh, database that wasn't reported. But then three years after, basically, now there is a new paper in 2023 by the same people that criticized the paper, they say that more or less the same thing. So, uh, you know, we made a three years uh, huge discussion and people were really stabbing in the uh, in the chest uh, uh, with the insults uh, from, from one to the other. And then in the end, everybody agrees, you know. Uh, so, why? Why? Because uh, probably we, we, we still have to make some steps to have this, this scientific uh, um, base uh, of, of elements that we can follow. And this is actually the, the forest monitoring is very important for that. Then very quickly coming to the, to the end of this uh, first statement, we also need um, to involve everybody who is concerned by forests, but uh, we need a wider governance, not only because forest multifunctionality now goes beyond the, the timber industry, but it has all the forest ecosystem services which are not necessarily represented, but also because uh, uh, here I might speak in favor of the forest owners because uh, uh, there's always sometimes criminalized that forest owners are, are, are bad. In reality, they are not necessarily rich because there is a whole value chain which is not necessarily with the forest owners but which is, which is with the downstream industry which is often not at the table now it's not to blame anybody but uh, all what happens after the, the tree services until the the, the paper comes uh, on this desk there is a, a whole value chain which is not necessarily today involved uh, in, in, into this discussion including costs for monitoring, for instance. So um, I think that the uh, uh, last thing I want to echo what, what Anna said uh, in terms of uh, difference by member state, this is very important. People always say, well, you can't, ha uh, well, we need to speak a common language, but we can't harmonize everything. We live in a, in forests in Europe are different, but that's an approach that we are following since some years. We are working by, on the basis of bio geographic regions. That's also the approach we use for the close to nature forest, uh, close to nature um, forestry yeah. guidelines. Uh, uh, and uh, the definition of old growth forests includes indicators that member states have to 
adapt to their situation. Of course, we want to have comparable situation. We have a common language, but, but we can certainly deal with the situation where uh, also for future guidelines on suicide forest management, where we rely on different uh, biogeographic uh, situations. So I think that is uh, as a beginning uh, what I can say. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Marco, for your being here and working on this for a long time. I have now uh, Nikolai Stefanuta online, I think. I don't know if you can join us, but I'm really pleased that you're putting forward all this uh, question on forest with me in the, in the group. I don't know if we can see or hear. I can, uh, I can definitely see and hear you. I've been uh, listening. Oh, well, perfect. You're here, Nico. I just wanted uh, to, to have you here also um, um, with us because I think you can give us maybe an insight how important is also this forest monitoring in your national context, not only maybe just for the forest as a such, but also politically. Maybe you can give us some, uh, some insight what is happening in, uh, in Romania. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> I would like to say welcome to the European Parliament, to those of you who came from Romania to this event. Um, I've just returned from the United States uh, right now uh, a few moments ago, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, to have been able to join you online. Now, uh, Anna is an ally. We have been working together on this file, on all the forest files, for some time now because uh, we had at least three main forest files uh, so far and we hope to have the forest monitoring law as a concluding work of this European Parliament. Now, uh, Anna's question is directed very clearly at my country because no matter what kind of system you have, if you don't check the reality on the ground, it might be useless. And I have to say that to the Commission because um, right before the summer, we, together with Anna, we were there and we saw the Commissioner and presented proof from Romania that illegal logging is still happening at a very large pace. And the progress that has been made through SUMAL and other uh, technical innovations and also through uh, satellite monitoring is not sufficient. And that the that progress that has been made has been made thanks to the pressure of the European Union, thanks to the shared competence that the European Union has, and thanks to also the threat of having an infringement procedure. So uh, reality always needs to be checked on the ground and not only in the capitals, I must say, because the numbers given by the capitals sometimes are so radically different than what we get on the ground. And in my country, the, the difference is staggering. I will give you just an example from a trip we did together with uh, Anna and other colleagues in May, uh, where we were on a site of illegal logging in the Fagarash Mountains. Uh, actually, no, I, I have to correct myself. It wasn't illegal logging. It was legal logging, uh, according to the papers. Uh, however, the method in which the logging was done was completely not uh, in line with uh, with uh, an ecological forestry approach. Uh, what was meant to be a progressive cutting was definitely a clear cut. Uh, you know, the papers, uh, then the local authorities gave us numbers on the illegal uh, logging that were ridiculously small. They were under 1%. And then the transport police uh, gave numbers that are at 3%. So from the same authorities, you get uh, a difference already. Now you have, then you have NGOs that have studied uh, the issue and they come up with numbers that as much as 50% of the timber uh, extracted and exported then from Romania is of illegal origin. So the phenomenon is between 0.16% that the local um, forest authorities were giving us, then eight times to the transport police who gave the number of 3%, and then uh, 16 times again to the number that the NGOs gave us. So somebody's not telling the truth, correct? You cannot have the same numbers being valid at the same time.
Okay, I think the message was really clear, but uh, I'm so sorry, Nico, that we lost you. Anna, was I cut at some point? You can make your conclusion. I believe you hear me now, no? Yes, we can hear you back. Okay, if you hear me now, it's all good. I'm sorry, I don't know where I was cut, but I was giving you the various numbers and I hope you got that part that the numbers varied so much that somebody really is not telling the truth. And that's why the importance of, of, uh, of uh, on-site inspection is so important. Now, I have some political points to, to, to still make, Anna, if it's possible. Uh, if we will have a forest monitoring law, which we really hope and we expect to have it, uh, the political numbers in the parliament are highly important. We saw during the nature restoration law how difficult it was to get a majority. And you have to know that there's a kill list right now ongoing in the European Parliament to kill environmental legislation. And uh, the forest uh, part is an important part of that kill list. Uh, so um, if NGOs uh, have an access to their MEPs or can, can name and shame or create other pressure, it is highly, highly important. We saw that that same kind of uh, of head-to-head uh, uh, -head competition in the, uh, for instance, in the clean air uh, uh, directive that we uh, that we had uh, two plenaries ago. So it is so it is always a very tight majority in this plenary. And I think if I think about 2024, the majority might be even tighter. So going back to the commission representatives that were present here, I think it goes the other way around. You shouldn't uh, abstain from providing more environmental legislation now because you might upset the extreme right. You should do it exactly now because the extreme right might have a bigger say in the next parliament. And I'm not saying to have environmental legislation just for the sake of beating the extreme right to it. But it's important for us to get the whole job done, to get all the legislative files that were presented in the in the Green Deal as a, as a package and, and present to the public uh, something that has a, a coherence from one end to the other. I want to say one more thing on uh, plan, on uh, on planting uh, in the resilience plans of many, many member states, there are uh, a vast number of uh, of, of planting. Uh, new forests, etc., uh, with European money from the resilience plants. I urge the Commission to watch those numbers because, for instance, uh, when there was an adjustment to the Romania's uh, national resilience plan, about half of the planting numbers got cut. So, uh, when governments have to choose between priorities, the environment, forestry, etc., is never a priority. And that has been demonstrated in the resilience plans that we've seen on their, under operation, not just in Romania, but in, in several other uh, several other member states. So I also urge the Commission to really use its shared competence on forest protection and build a good forest mon monitoring law. Don't be, don't get impressed by uh, your enemies. I know that that um, some you have some powerful uh, contestants in the council, especially, but also in the parliament. But do use your shared competence. We have always reaffirmed it in the European Parliament. So uh, do that and also watch very much the implementation on the ground of uh, any monitoring system that will be chosen. And I stand behind Anna's argument that it has to be comparable because otherwise uh, member states just report no matter what and uh, the Commission has to accept uh, the reporting uh, as such. Thank you once more for, for having me. Thank you, Nicolae, for this really political message and clear message. Um, we are running out of time, but I want to take one round of question more, and I think we, are, we can close here the panel with your question. And I think uh, you can also yeah, present yourself and um, give your question, maybe uh, or also a statement, because we're here now in, in the final discussion. I will take you... Um, and the back, yes, you. I thank you so much, Bruno Camps from Euronatur. So uh, obviously we're one of the NGOs working in uh, Romania doing these analysis. 
one of the things that I think is really important to point out, and I think uh, uh, Nicolas uh, already mentioned, is that a lot of the logging that's actually happening is legal. So these, this is this is not illegal logging because we we keep talking a lot about illegal logging, but these are actually actual logging that's permitted to take place in protected areas without no evaluation, um, without any sort of understanding of the impact it's actually having, um, and so. I think it's really important to also to, to, to point that out and not just focus on, on the aspects of illegal logging, but also on the aspects of actual legal logging. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention is that there is a, a clear difference between what's happening in, let, let's say, in Central Eastern Europe and what's happened in Western Europe. And I think it's also really important to differentiate because in Western Europe, not offense to to let's say Western Europe, but most of the let's say primary and old growth forests are not there anymore. And while in Central Eastern Europe you still have quite a lot of those that really need to be protected, while in Western Europe you're looking at more of a restoration uh, aspect of recovering these forests. So it's a really different way of looking at the system and hence the, the monitoring of itself would also be different and what is the objective and what to expect. So I think it's it's important to also differentiate and I think the what, what was mentioned about like in France that is Climate change is actually a, a big impact now. I'm not suggesting that it's not, but as I think Marco has already said, it's also the choices that have been made in, in the past that today your forests are not resilient to climate change. So I think it's also really important to remember that. And um, and my last point is actually it's a couple of questions that I'm going to give to the to, to the to the floor. So uh, my first one is actually to to the colleague from France. Um, can you just say? From just as a yes or no, or, or is is the private forest uh, uh, association? Are you actually uh, uh, wanting to have a forest monitoring legislation? Because for us, that's you know we've just heard here that we need a forest monitoring legislation, and we really need it to 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 stop sort of what's happening to forests. But I wasn't very clear from your statement if you actually do want it or not. So it's just from you to just to give a clear answer, yes or no, whether you want such a legislation. And just for Marco, if that's okay, um, <laughs> it's just a question actually on, and on the basis of reporting. So one of the aspects that is really important is that member states report back specific details of what's happening at national level and that this monitoring legislation actually comes back, like for example, how they're actually defining old growth forests because it will be left to national, at national level. But if this is not actually being understood um, so there's this level of details that also we, we really would require so is the foreign forest marshal legislation going to have such types of reporting back thank you thank you for this really specific question uh, my name is Anna Holmberg I represent the Swedish forest industries I have a very short question to stay on time I have not heard much about the granularity of data today in the discussion are we talking about data collection, and this is primarily to Marco, are we talking about data collection on forest holding level? Are we talking on regional level? Are we talking on national level? Uh, because if we are going on forest holding level, then there needs to be a very good balance versus the ownership rights of the people who actually own the forest. Thank you. Thank you for this very concise question. I have a last question here in front. Micro, please. Uh, money to Romania to build up uh, uh, institutions to control better the illegal extraction uh, of wood. Uh, it's long uh, uh, in the past uh, Greenpeace accused um, uh, the, this illegal uh, ex extraction and it's very, very important to give money to build up an office for the forest. Uh, how, uh, in, in Italia, the Forestale, a, a state institution, and this is uh, very important for Romania. Thank you. So I think the question are really clear. Um, it will be not a, such a, an easy exercise now because we have to round up the whole discussion and also to take uh, answer to, to, to this. Um, so I, I have... A, um, I have this point that it's really important. Um, legal or illegal logging is uh, really important, of course, but we see in a lot of countries that 
they are making it legal at the Natura 2000 legislation, it would be not acceptable because after, and I went there with Niku, you can just see that the state of conservation is just broke, and that's not the purpose from Natura 2000, but even the authorities are um, allowing it to, to log. And it is called uh, progressive logging, and when we go there, you see in a few years there is nothing anymore, so the conservation state is not there anymore. So it's, it's illegal, but it's legal at the national level, but illegal uh, at the conservation level. And that's really important for us um, to have some insights how these ecological impact assessment are taking place um, or not. Um, restoration for other part of, uh, of, uh, of Europe, I think that's really important because we cannot compare everything, but uh, we are going to make um, to have to make joint effort. If we are monitoring what we have, we cannot just uh, burden those who have the last uh, old growth forest and the other one not. So they have to deliver also and to deliver more in the managed uh, forest, of course. And um, yeah, so I have the, uh, the clear question to you. Is private forest uh, wanting the forest monitoring law in France? Yeah, thank you for the, for the question, but uh, maybe you have more information than me. <laughs> sorry, sorry to say that. I, I'm just based in Paris. I follow European files, but... You are speaking about forest monitoring law. It's, it's a regulation. It's a directive. I, I don't know. I don't have the information. I don't know. And I didn't understand now what are the goals or the objectives of this uh, text and what is the added value and to whom it, it, it addresses this, uh, this document. So I don't, have, I don't have the information you have, so it's complicated for me to answer to your, to your question. And when we'll have the final text, uh, I will be happy to, to get back to you and and to give us uh, to give to give you our our view. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, that's for sure. That we that we what, that we needed the text before. I will give uh, the, the word to you, Marco, because we had this precise question on the report back. Thank you, Anna. For the sake of, of time, I'll be very fast. Four, four things have been asked. Well, first of all, uh, uh, if login is legal, but it's not complying with the natural legislation, is illegal. So I uh, confirm what Anna said. So. Um, um, now, the level of detail uh, and reporting uh, to Bruna. Um, I, I wouldn't speak so much of reporting because reporting raises always a, a stomachache and by member states. I think it's important to talk about publishing, making data available. Uh, and uh, I think this is something that has to come anyway. Uh, old Grow Forest, uh, um, you know that in the new Renewable Energy Directive is uh, mentioned, but uh, as defined by the member states. So. I guess the member states will also have to, to, to inform how, how they define it. And then the guidelines the Commission published uh, provide for some indicators and then there will be discussion, follow-up and so on. So we take for granted that this will not be secret. There will be kind of, of discussion on how member states define them. At least this is my personal perception. Uh, to Anna Holmberg on uh, granularity. I mean, today the granularity, is, is, as we heard, is already very fine. We, we can get down to one per one meter. Uh, but the point is not so much whether we want the data. Uh, the, the point is, of course, for certain indicators, for certain functions of the forest, we do need the, the, the information at the stand level. But the point is uh, that doesn't mean that the data which are private will be disclosed because one thing is to collect data at stand level and then to, uh, to elaborate um, uh, indicators that show what the situation is. Another thing is to disclose data which are private property or, or, or uh, that, that fall under, under the sphere that shouldn't be released. And that you can be completely sure we are absolutely uh, not impinging on, on, on the rights of people of uh, having their own private information disclosed, commercially sensible stuff and so on. But of course, the, 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 you might need, uh, for certain indicators, we, we, you do need data at the at stand level, so fine granularity. And finally, the question on, uh, of whether the EU can give money to Romania to better control uh, the, the, the logging and so on. I, I'm sure it can, because I'm not a specialist of that, but I'm sure that under the RFF, the, the CAP, uh, the, the cohesion funds, there's plenty of possibility, but these are always negotiated between the Commission and the Member States. So the Commission cannot just go to Romania and say, oh, this is the money that you now have to use for that purpose. It's always a negotiation process. So if Romania asks, I'm sure there are, there's plenty of possibility, but this is a bilateral process uh, that, has to, that is always negotiated, so that the initiative in this situation always comes from the Member State. 
Yeah, and to my last speaker, maybe also this question, because you stepped in with this, uh, with this stand. Uh, what do you think, a forest monitoring law, what should be the base of information? And if you have this idea that if we are stepping in, changing somewhere a protection level or changing somewhere a forest management, how can be this uh, compensation, but what, which kind of data we, we need to make it properly? Well, indeed, there shouldn't be shortcuts in the methodology so that if, for example, you look at the blanket uh, satellite monitoring, you've done an illegal logging there, that will definitely be uh, opposed. But uh, with the right data and right policy, uh, I would refer also to the Swedish uh, case. In Finland, all forest data is open to everybody, not only property level, stand level, tree level, and the forest owners just love it because it has created the market also for timber supply, timber buying. And I think this is exactly where the Commission legislation could come, that make data open, make it detailed, make it reliable, and then provide the financial incentives also for its owners to get compensated for high conservation value. And there's a bright future. Thank you very much. And I remember just the audience, uh, I think you're all aware, but we, as a parliament and other, as, as a you, we decided uh, on the LULUCF. So we have some, um, uh, yeah, some result to prove. And also I think that should be a really um, a great target from the forest monitoring law that, that we, we, we could have uh, an idea if we are, we are going to, uh, uh, to reach the targets of the LULUCF because we decided... And now, I, when I'm speaking with the member state, they just uh, say, yeah, we can, we can have a look how many tons of CO2 we should um, sink or keep in the ground uh, through the LULUCF. But actually, we don't have any data to really prove the evolution, uh, to, make, to maybe compensate the right people doing the right things. So I think um, the forest monitoring law should also uh, take into account our already decided uh, huge um, targets by the LULUCF because we are all in the same boat um, with, the, with the forest owner, uh, with, um, with the NGO and with the whole um, society that wants, of course, a great forest tomorrow. And with these words, I uh, give you the opportunity to, uh, to have a break today and I hope you enjoyed our discussion and thank you very much to all the panelists and every people uh, working for Forest in Europe. Bye.